question my colleague Nana. Uh, so my name is Charles Waweru. I am a carbon projects developer in the company called Vas Carbon, based here in Nairobi, Kenya, somewhere in Westlands. Uh, we basically assist um, medium and small holder carbon object, carbon assets owners to develop their different kinds of uh, carbon projects, which I shall explain the different kinds of scopes that are there. And also we provide a platform where we bring together uh, different players within the, the, the industry. So it's an ecosystem of sorts where we bring together the buyers, the sellers, the tech, tech providers uh, and so forth within our ecosystem. And I'll talk more about that as we proceed. Um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, there's quite a big interest from a quite a number of uh, Kenyans and Africans largely who really want to understand more about what is this uh, thing called carbon assets because we know there's something there, selling of air of sorts, and uh, people are just curious. Um, they see foreign companies coming in uh, into Africa, the, the continent, and then they they do something with trees, something with the cook stores and whatnot, and then some kind of money is generated. How the money is generated? Who who gives them these credits? What does the credit means? I think these are some of the overriding questions that the most of you have, and uh, I have some presentation. It's, it's a bit uh, long, but I will try to be very concise and less technical because the market in itself is quite huge. It has been there since, I can say, 2004. Yes, it has been there for quite some time. But of course, within the African continent, the awareness has only been there for the last uh, about 10 years, but it has been really on the uh, low key. So I'll just try and give you the 101. That is, I'm just going to catalyze some bit of curiosity and also to give you information that maybe you can later on go and try and uh, explore. So that said, it being a webinar, your expectation is to get this information. And my expectation as um, a speaker or an instructor or a facilitator is that uh, I hope you either have a pen and paper somewhere because sometimes in the description or in the explanation, I will stress on something and I will want you to go and read more about it or investigate more about it, or you can also reach out to me to learn more about it. Alternatively, it could be an idea that will come to your mind. So it's good always that whenever having a webinar, you do some kind of not taking, if possible, of course, I will provide the, the slide deck, but like in any PowerPoint presentation, it, it's mostly succinct information and images. It's always good for you to, to take notes of things. You are also free to screenshot if you're using your phone. You are free to screenshot the images and the presentation. There, there is no uh, problem with that. But just, uh, I, I know some of you are uh, you're somewhere in the highway. Others are still working. That is good. But just try and make sure you are in a very quiet environment so as we can be able to have a very productive session. And also, I will, I will, you'll allow me to we mute all the mics so you don't have those inter interruptions or if I'm not to mute all the mics, then we, we try and, and be very attentive eh? and avoid the interruptions as much as reasonably possible. And also I'm going to switch off my videos so as I cannot have a, I cannot uh, overwhelm the band connection because I know we are from different parts of the country or the continent from what I've had and we might have differences in uh, the, the network. So that said, I will kick off my presentation. And I think from, from uh, the invitation sent out by my colleague Nana, you saw this quite a bit to cover. So I will try and, and be as clear as possible, as audible as possible. And uh, should you have any question, uh, at the end of every session, we shall be taking, I'll, I'll, I'll pause, and uh, ask, we have like two minutes, not only just for a uh, for break, but also for somebody to ask a question. So you can either wait until then, then you can ask your question. Alternatively, you can be dropping your question in the chat box, and then I'll be able to, to respond to the question. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll try and make sure the session is as brief as reasonably or unreasonably possible. So I'm going to start sharing my my screen, I'll give it uh, about 30 seconds for everybody to be able to see my screen. I'm going into 
presentation mode. And if you are able to see my screen, it's a presentation, perhaps maybe somebody can just text on the box or just say, yeah, I can see. So I can make sure we are on the same page. Yeah, we can see. Ah, perfect, perfect. We can see, but no, perfect. Good, good, good. So to begin, the first session is basic introduction and I'll, I'll try and fly here, literally fly because the most of you are people who have an interest or are practitioners within the climate and environmental space. Maybe one or two might not be into it, but I'm sure uh, you guys are familiar with the basics of climate change. So that said, could I just have one random person simply try and tell us how do we, where did this thing come called the climate change? Stroke, global warming, stroke, whatever, where did it come from? Just one person. First to Mike, chap chap. Yeah, uh, Richard Kenovi is my name. I think yes, climate yes. change is uh, about the climate change is about the changing weather patterns that uh, you know involve uh, the rain patterns, the sun, and uh, the, you know the the natural uh, appearance. In other words, the the, the, the general ecological uh, setup. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And uh, in a nutshell. I don't know if, if you, most of you can remember where all, all these conversations on, uh, on, on climate change started. Maybe if, if I can trigger, I can try and trigger a memory. Once upon a time before the 90s, people, there, there was not much about uh, climate change or global warming. But then there were one or two scientists or a collegiate or scientists who were talking about, hey, the ice caps are melting and so forth and so forth, and they're melting because the, 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 the planet is getting warmer and warmer. People wonder, what do you mean the planet is getting warmer and warmer? It has been warm as usual. I think one of the key things that triggered a change in mindset and conversations among the people was when the, the former US Vice President under Bill Clinton, Al Gore, was part of this documentary called The Inconvenient Truth. If, if most of you can remember, if you are not aware of the film, maybe you can just have a look at it. It's a nice documentary on climate. I think it was one of the earliest documentaries telling the world, hey, the planet is getting warmer. So how is the planet getting warmer? You can see on your screen that I'm displaying something. I, I'll be very brief, I don't want to be very scientific, but basically, you know where the sun comes, the, the sun rays comes from, it comes from the, of course, the, the sun itself, it's a, it's a star. Now, when it's emitting its rays in the form of radiation, we have the ozone layer, which ideally is supposed to be able to reflect back some of the rays because the rays are radioactive. And if you remember basic chemistry, if, if you are exposed to radiation, there'll be some consequences. In the case of the sun, besides the impact of radiation itself, there's a question of the, the, the heat, the warmth. However, because of the ozone layer, we're able to reflect some of it. However, because of what we call anthropogenic human activities, the level or the thickness of the ozone layer has been decreasing over time, and hence permitting some of the rays to penetrate those on layer. We shall talk about how, what has been, what do you mean by anthropogenic? What can make those on layer depleted in, in just a few? But essentially, when now the, 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 the rays penetrate those on layer and come to ground, some of these uh, rays are, tend to be absorbed by the, the, the land mass. And over time, of course, literally when you're walking on bare feet on, on, uh, in, the, in an afternoon, when the sun is at its peak, you can literally feel the ground is hot, stroke warm. Now, unfortunately, when the heat is trying to evacuate from the, uh, from the land to go back to the atmosphere, again, because of different kinds of greenhouse gases, which we shall talk about them later, they tend to form a kind of blockage within the Earth's atmosphere, and hence, the heat cannot, again, be evacuated from the planetary system, and hence, resulting in an overall increase in heat. Now, the overall increase in heat will have now different impacts, hence the term climate change. It could maybe lead to the, the case of increased uh, currents of droughts, increased in currents of famine, and also and, on and so forth. In the case of Kenya, I think uh, those who are here, you can appreciate that where you, if let's say you are born and raised in Ruaka, the temperature in Ruaka is not the same as it was 20 years ago. 
And for a number of reasons, one of them is the simple fact that we have been replacing greenery, that is forests and bushes and grassland with concrete, buildings, roads, cabro and so forth and so forth. And you will appreciate from basic biology that trees are responsible for absorbing this CO2 from the atmosphere and overall with time they're able to trigger rainfall and so forth and hence try and balance the climates. But because we have been doing a lot of anthropogenic activities here as Kenya or here as in Africa, then we find that our rainfall patterns are changing and hence the term climate change. Where the carbon market comes in is very simple. You have, you will appreciate that one reason why we have been bringing down trees and putting buildings and industries because we want to industrialize as a nation. But again, you have to remember that as in as much as we are industrializing as a nation, there's going to be an impact on the, on the environment. That said, the basis of us now coming up with what you call the carbon market is we are trying to incentivize or trying to mitigate or strike a balance between industrialization and global warming. And we shall talk about what we mean by trying to incentivize. Are we, are we saying we are, we are allowing people to cut down trees because of industries? No. I'm just trying to say is that uh, we are trying to find a, 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 a balancing act because people must keep on doing industries, building industries and manufacturing. At the same time, we have to, we have to be aware that whatever is coming up from the industries are going to be used by humans. And humans are living on a planet and the planet is getting warmer. So how then do we strike the balance? And that's where the carbon markets comes in. And this thing called carbon credit which I shall come to explain in the, in the presentation. Then somebody will ask, are you trying to tell us that previously the, the planet was not warm? Well, I'm sure some of you have been coming across this particular graph here, and you can see that the graph in terms of the amount of CO2 on the left column of the y-axis has been as high as 300, about 400,000 years ago, and then at around 350,000 years ago, it went down. So somebody will simply ask, a climate skeptic, a climate change skeptic will ask, oh, so from this graph, it means that uh, we have been having the CO2 or other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere even before and it went down. So how can we explain that? It is very simple. Those of you, again, are familiar, or, uh, are familiar with the, the development of uh, the planet from a geographical perspective. You remember the way the planet was transforming in terms of the continents and whatnot, and then there are these massive volcanic eruptions and so forth. Or for example, if you are into move, movies, and you might have seen a movie called Pompeii, you remember that volcanic eruption which covered that, that entire city? You can imagine when the volcano was erupting, there's a lot of emission of gases, ashes, and of course, the varroal heat. So because of various geological activities, like volcanic eruptions, then the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere was increasing. And then as the volcanoes are, are now becoming more and more dormant like Mount Kenya, then the gases reduce from the atmosphere and of course the heat reduced from the atmosphere. Hence why you see from the graph, things are going up and down, up and down over the thousands of years in, in time. So any climate skeptic, or if you're an environmental conservationist and somebody is asking you about uh, the, Ah, uh, yeah, some, I, I can see someone talking about Goma. Very good. Yes, Goma is a very, very good example here in Africa. You can imagine when, when the, 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 the mountain uh, erupted, the amount of heat and gas which are there. And, and, and again, this goes to show that there are other activities within the planet which are also contributing to the warming, the global warming. And so if you're an enthusiast and someone is talking about this graph, I think now you know how to explain to them. The second graph is simply now showing, trying to show it over the last 1,000 years. And this, of course, will be explained by what you call the Industrial Revolution. Again, students of history are familiar with the agriculture, the, the agrarian revolution, communities like in Mesopotamia and so forth, agricultural industry, agriculture transformed or became now the industrial, the industrial sector. And of course, things like rubber was, 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 was finally known. It can create tires. Tires went into cars cars were not being manufactured and so forth and so forth. So the up and down again will be towards mostly the anthropogenic activities. Now, to come to this conversation on carbon markets, and, and, and uh, please be taking screenshots right now as, we, as I'm, I'm explaining. Somebody is saying no sound. 
Can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Yes, we can hear you. We, we, can, yeah. we can hear you very well. Okay, Let him continue. check with his speakers. Let him okay. check with his speakers. Okay. Okay. And please keep on putting those comments in the in the chat box because I know we're in different parts of let's say Kenya, different parts of Africa or the world for that matter. So if you it's also going to be very good for you to be sharing experiences as I'm describing or as I'm explaining whatever I'm presenting. Now, please, from this point onwards, please be taking screenshots of whatever I'm presenting because the lesson has actually now kicked away. Really, the, the one before was, was merely like I say hot gossip because it's it's something very basic, if I can say that. So if you really want to go into the, to, to understand the carbon markets and you go to a workshop or a forum or a conference like the one to go in Africa, in, in Nairobi, the Africa Climate Summit or the next COP in Dubai, and you go into a room where it's a technical room, you must understand some of these definitions. Uh, there, there are hundreds of definitions, but I've tried to pick some of the most commonly used ones so you have to make sure before you go to the next climate conference or workshop and you'll find scientists and technocrats and policy makers make sure you understand this source because they'll be flying around the room and the last thing you want is to let's say you're an english speaker and you walk into a room and they're only Swahili speakers so in this case you don't want to be a social whereby you're a climate enthusiast but you're walking into a room where there are scientists or climate scientists and you don't understand some of the, the terms so please take a screenshot and of course, you can always read more about them online. So anthropogenic, as I said, anthropogenic, as I said, is simply, and anthropogenic simply means human activity. So when I say anthropogenic emission, I'm simply talking about emissions, greenhouse gas emissions as a result of human activities. And I think you know that. Last night, maybe you, 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 you cooked with a, in a, in a three, three stone, um, Fireplace using charcoal or uh, or firewood. Okay, yes. So I'm sure you, you can now begin to relate what we mean by anthropogenic emissions. This term called baseline. If you ever want to go into carbon price development, the term baseline should be literally be your second name, because baseline is what is used to to indicate or show. Somebody mute your mic, mute your mic. Thank you. Yeah. So baseline is simply a term that is trying to, 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 to represent the, the scenario of the present moment. For example, if you want to undertake a carbon project dealing with, let's say, forestry, then you are trying to, and, and, and specifically, you want to do what you call, uh, let's say, afforestation or reforestation. Reforestation meaning trees are cut down and now you want to plant more trees. So the baseline will imply what is the current composition of trees within this particular area? What is the present situation? So as then, when you are undertaking your, your, your reforestation activities, you can measure the difference between the then and the, the now. So the baseline will be closely be, be, be tied in with the business as usual or sometimes if you're going through documents, it will be labeled as BAU, BAU, okay? So what is the business decision now? What is the baseline now for you before for you, before you let's undertake your, your carbon projects? And there are different kind of carbon projects, but of course the simplest one to explain is usually forest, but you will see from where you're sitting, there are over 170 different types of carbon projects. We shall get, that, we shall get to that. A, a typical term like biomass, I think you all familiar with biomass, uh, if let's say you're, you're living in an, in an agricultural uh, household, you, you can talk about the, the excrement from the livestock and then the energy from it. Next uh, screenshot, please, take screenshot, uh, is carbon sequestration. I'll use the basic example of a trees. You know that trees breathe in carbon dioxide. So carbon sequestration is simply saying the process in which you're either going to capture the carbon dioxide or even proceed and do the, the storage. One example of, of uh, carbon secretion from the forest I can talk about less is the mangroves. If you are part of Eastern Africa, the Eastern African coastline, parts of uh, the Southern Africa coastline in Cape Town, or parts of West Africa like Equatorial Guinea, all the to Cote d'Ivoire, there are very good uh, mangrove concentrations there. 
and mangroves are very good when it comes to the sequestration of carbon dioxide. And, and we can talk more about this in maybe another session in terms of how can forests or mangroves specifically capture. Then there's a term called carbon dioxide. You all talk about dioxide CO2, but when you are coming to the carbon market conversation, it's not just CO2. You will see, you will see it is, it's specifically CO2E equivalent. Why? Remember, there are a number of greenhouse gases, and I'll give you some of them, something like methane, nitrogen dioxide, all these are examples of greenhouse gases. But because these different greenhouse gases have got different what we call global warming potential, we, when, when, when you're doing our calculations, we have to find the equivalence of methane, for example, to carbon dioxide. For example, depending on which IPCC report, this is uh, the previous one, there's one which came out, the, it came out early this year, I've not updated. It says methane, the one from 2002 says that methane, is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide, meaning one ton of methane is equivalent to 25 tons of carbon dioxide. Now, what this particular means, for example, is if you are undertaking a livestock methane carbon project, and let's say your project is able to capture or sequester one ton of methane through whatever you're doing with the livestock, then it then implies that you have sequestered 25 tons of CO2E equivalent. If you are doing something on refrigerators, the, the HFC, the hydrocarbons coming from the refrigerators, the HFC, the, the, the carbon warming potential is in the thousands. So for every ton of the HFCs, its equivalent is about 9,800 for the CO2. I'll give you a table. It's technical, but just brush through. So just make sure you take a screenshot. But basically, that's what you mean by CO2E. So whenever you come across this term, just know we are talking about the equivalent, which means the particular carbon project was not just dealing with CO2, it could be dealing with methane or any other greenhouse gas. Uh, let's come to carbon footprints, very clear. Literally, today, you are maybe going to the market to get vegetables for the next week. You most likely use uh, a matatu, okay? Which chances are it is not electric, they're using diesel or petrol, whatever it is. Those are fossil fuels. They, they do the they lead towards the emission of the greenhouse gases. So it means literally when you are working from your home, let's say in, in, in Kabete, going to let's say the Gikomba market and you're using uh, a non-electric car, then literally, as the name says, you are leaving a whole lot of carbon footprints as you are moving. Uh, a good example uh, on uh, some of the things people do to, uh, to abate the amount of carbon footprint is within the airlines. The airline industry have actually developed their own mini industry or other mini carbon project. It's called Corsia. Towards, uh, they're looking for high quality carbon projects that can that generate carbon credits, which I'll explain in a short while what, how exactly we come to that. So as then airline companies can get to purchase them, so as to can, they can emit the amount of emissions they're doing is the flying passengers all over the planet. Next, we have got a carbon sink. So, so in, in, in a nutshell, you know forests, the, 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 they, they, they have absorbed the carbon dioxide, but maybe I can ask a question to you, and, and there's no right or wrong answer. Just, uh, I'm not trying to gauge, let, let's just see. If you think about it, who or what, is the largest carbon sink in the planet. Try and think. Scott, if you have an answer, please go to your matchup chat and uh, tell me what or who do you think is the largest carbon sink in the planet? Ocean. Ah, very good. Why, why are you saying ocean? Hello, the person who said ocean, maybe you can tell us why are you saying ocean? Is it because, because of the Because of the coral reef. Because of the coral reef. Okay, somebody else? Why, why do you think ocean is the largest carbon sink? I'll give you some very basic hints. Whereas we as humans believe that we live on land, but within the oceans, there are other organisms, number one. Number two, there are also other 
non what's the word what's the what's the phrase non-animal organism that is the plants and what so and what not so somebody has mentioned on the, the issue of the reefs and what not so the ocean when it comes to the absorptions of uh, I, I can see there's a hand from Madeline yes Madeline go ahead let's be very quick on the way you say what you think oceans are the largest carbon sink I'd go to uh, the reason why I would say ocean. It supports it supports uh, other other lives such as uh, sea grasses, mangroves, that are also part of uh, major uh, carbon sequestering uh, ecosystems. Thank you. I have actually summarized my my explanation, but just for iteration, remember things like wetlands, the mangroves I was mentioning earlier. They're mostly on the on the coastlines. And they're very good in terms of carbon sequestration. Also, you have what you call seagrass, that is grass found within the seas. Please, if you're not familiar with some of the things I'm mentioning or being mentioned here, just write them down somewhere and you can do your own personal exploration. Seagrasses, mangroves, wetlands. All these things are very good when it comes to the sequestration of carbon dioxide. Moving on, we have take a screenshot now of the greenhouse gases. I'll, the, I'll have a, a separate schedule showing you the different classes of the greenhouse gases, but, but uh, later on. Then uh, I'm sure within your, within your um, conversation with county, with the government officials, or in workshop, I've come across this one called NDCs. Okay, so basically, the NDC refers to the national determined contributions, and we are, we are saying that. Uh, each country comes up with a target and says, we want to have our indices are going to be this amount by this percentage by a particular given year. It's usually a very hot, con it's a very hot conversation because here in Africa, we're saying we don't do a lot of industrialization. Most of this that happens in Europe, North America, Australia, and the UK. So they should have higher indices compared to us here in Africa. And if not, then we must have an international mechanism where we can do a balance off of the NDCs. These mechanisms, things like what you have, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, we shall cover them in detail later in our uh, conversation. Then we have got a, a term called net zero uh, CO2 emissions. So basically, we are, we, we are trying to say is that um, whenever you're undertaking any anthropogenic activity, any human activity, whether it's going to be industry or whatnot, let's make sure that the GHG emissions coming from your factory there's going to be a net balancing effect. So for example, if you're going to be emitting a thousand tons of CO2E, then you must do something in correspondence to offset that a thousand tons which you have emitted. I've used a very important term, offsetting. Remember, for example, I'll give you the example of, uh, think of it like a bank overdraft. You maybe have a hundred dollars in your bank, and then when you're going to withdraw, maybe you have a good uh, credit facility, and instead of withdrawing a hundred, you're able to withdraw and then $20, so the 20 is, because, is an excess, which you have to pay back the bank. You have to offset that extra $20 you've taken, okay? So basically what you're saying with net zero is whatever you emit, try and make sure you've also removed it. By that in itself, I'm already trying to show you what a carbon credit means, the issue of offsetting. You have emitted this amount beyond the limits you're given and you have to offset, you have to negate it from the limits which you are initially given. Let me move the mics. Okay. Then I'm sure you've also heard of the Red Plus, especially if you're into the forest programs, reducing emissions from the forestation and forest degradation. Uh, it's a basically it's a UNFCC uh, framework or program developed and um, people or other entities like the UNDP is very keen on this within countries that have, have, have seen massive deforestation within the, the economies. And, and again, we might be very quick to criticize people who undertake deforestation, but remember for some communities, they literally live off the forest for, for one reason or the other. So a Red Plus project is whereby we are, we are trying to either prevent or mitigate or reduce or avoid deforestation, while at the same time making sure that the livelihoods of the communities living within the forest are not going to be entirely changed. And this is also one of the different types of carbon projects, which we shall, of course, be examining today in brief. Last but not least, 
uh, this is where you and I individually, you know, we've been talking about industries, manufacturer, and whatnot, but also, also you and I uh, contribute. We contribute to GHG. And uh, the contribution of the individual or the industry is classified what you call scope one emission, scope two emission, and scope three emission. So for example, a scope one emission is, uh, is, is a, basically it's a direct emission from uh, a controlled uh, source. For example, you decide to burn firewood. That's as simply as put, it is uh, a scope one emission, okay? A scope two emission, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the case of Kenya, for example, it could be that which is coming out from KPLC, the Kenya Power and Lighting Company, and of course, Kenjen. So for example, if they decide to generate electricity from uh, a fossil fuel like diesel to turn the turbines, and then you as an end user receive and use that electricity, then it means you are a beneficiary or a, or a, or a or a producer of the scope two emissions. And of course, uh, when it comes to scope three emissions, think of it this way, your phones have certain minerals. There's a uh, nickel, cobalt used in the manufacture of your phones. So some energy, some fossil fuel is used in the extraction of that cobalt from let's say the Congo, and then to ship to, to Taiwan to put these microboard chips for the phone, and then the phone was designed in Taiwan and then it was imported to, to, to Kenya or anywhere else. That amount of emissions is what we call now the scope three, which is indirect, but now like a third party emitter, but also you are a beneficiary. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the long and short of it is that we are all emitters. So we have a responsibility to make sure we try and negate whatever we are emitting from the environment individually, collectively as an organization, or also nationally as a country, because you have the luxury of living in a planet right now that the air is clean. So you have to make sure that posterity gets to live or rather benefits as much as you did. Now we, we go to, I mentioned earlier on the issue of um, the greenhouse gases. There, there, there are quite many, I, I picked some of the most common ones. And of course, uh, criminal number one is carbon dioxide. We all know about carbon dioxide. I'll quickly go to methane. Now, in most economies, I can give you the example of Kenya. Kenya's leading contributor of greenhouse gases, most of you think it's a transport industry, but ladies and gentlemen, it is not. It's actually methane, which comes from the agricultural sector. We have livestock, dairy, and beef that do a lot of this. And I can talk more about this later on. My company actually currently, we are developing a livestock methane abatement program in one of the counties, you'll have, you'll have, excuse me, I cannot uh, be very specific because of uh, guidelines and whatnot until it's put on our website, but basically livestock methane is a leading contributor of the emissions within the continent. But then you have to understand that you cannot say you're not going to be having livestock. No, 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 no. We must have this because it's a source of livelihood for a number of people and also the, the economy. So what we are saying is how can we reduce the amount of methane being produced by livestock. One easy way, and it's being done in the, like about five or six carbon projects in the world that are dealing with the, the reduction of methane from livestock. And one of the key ways is by changing, changing the, the feed. For example, those of you who have been to farms, when this dairy cattle, for example, is eating grass or stopovers or whatever it's eating, because of the kind of the, the, the rumen, the, the, the stomach, there's a kind of digestion that undergoes the stomach that leads to the production or emission of methane. Yes, in as much as they're producing CO2, like in, but also we have uh, methane being produced as well. So by changing the kind of feed it's having, we can be able to reduce the amount of methane. For example, a typical dairy cattle in uh, parts of Rift Valley and Western Kenya emits about 54 kilograms of methane per annum one kettle. So you can imagine a farm with a thousand kettle. That's 54,000 kilograms of methane. Now think of it continentally, the amount of methane we're emitting. So depending on who you go to, they can develop for you a very good uh, carbon abatement program to deal with methane. And of course, I, we shall explain then how do we get the credits from that abatement. Abatement meaning the, the sequestration or the reduction of the greenhouse gas. Uh, and to all, it's also one of the, uh, the emissions. You can get them from agricultural activities and industrial activities. I've talked about fluorinated gases. Some of you can remember once upon a time, we used to have 
these aerosols, the sprays, the perfumes, which are having a lot of these HFCs, but we have managed to avoid them. Then, of course, there is the, the ozone layer, which is also surprisingly a greenhouse gas, but of course, it's not as potent as the rest. And also, interestingly, water vapor. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you are surprised why are we saying water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. It's because it, it, it leads to warming of atmosphere. And I'll give you an example. If you have been to some of these funny, funny matatus, this uh, matatus, you may find sometimes the driver pulls, pulls up the front seat and pours water into the radiator. And then he closes, uh, he puts back the chair. And then when you go in and sit in the front seat, you feel some kind of warmth on, the, on, on, on your seat. That's just an example of how a water vapor can also be classified as a, as a greenhouse gas. Or, or of course, it's not as potent as the other, but it is scientifically uh, can be considered to be one of them. The, the somebody was drawn something funny on the screen. I don't know if you can all see, I hope it's not ob obstructing. Then also, what I'm, I'm, I'm displaying right now is uh, what you call the global warming potential. Remember, I've talked about the potency of, let's say, methane. So if you can, let's go to column number five, GWP 100. It simply means the global warming potential in 100 years. So because carbon dioxide is the best, is the best reference point, it's always going to be one. But then if you go to, let's say, methane, the global warming potential of methane in 100 years is 29, meaning one ton of methane has an equivalence to 29 tons of carbon dioxide. So that's, that, that conversion is very important when it comes to C or when it comes to carbon project development, it's a very, very important figure. Let's say if you are doing, if you are doing a project in, uh, with the refrigerator, that is now you're going to chemical industries project, and you're dealing, let's say, with the sulfur, a lot of sulfur here. Okay, but let's say if you're dealing with the uh, HFC that's two, so, so found in, in, uh, in, in the manufacture of the refrigerator gas, you know that gas that powers, that's used to bring out the coal, eh? HFC 32. So the, the GWP or for every 100 years of HFC 32 is 771, meaning for every one ton of HFC 32 that you have abated or removed, it is an equivalent of 771 tons of carbon dioxide. So 771 tons CO2E, the equivalence. And if, if, if this, this particular table will make more sense, we come to, when we're coming to the level of carbon, carbon project development and also how do we calculate the emissions and whatnot. I won't want to get into those details in this particular session. So to wind up this, part, this first session then, what are we saying is a carbon offset or a carbon credit? Now, I, I want you to be very, very attentive and clear on this. Number one, from where I'm sitting or from where most of the industry players are sitting, these two terms are often used interchangeably to imply the same thing, but technically they're not the same thing, but for the ease of communication and understanding, we regard them as the same thing. Remember the example I used for uh, bank. You have $100 in your bank, but you have got a good credit rating, you can withdraw more of a draft. So instead of withdrawing 100, you are able to withdraw $120. But that $20 you've exceeded the withdrawn, it's not yours. You have to pay it back. You have to offset it, okay? Now, let's come to the conversation of carbon markets. To the genesis of the carbon markets, the initial emphasis was put on the governments, okay? Where each government was given a particular NDC target. And then of course for the government, because the government is not technically a manufacturer, it now put it on the local manufacturing industries. So for example, a car manufacturer like BMW will be told by its government that, for every given year, the amount of emission that you are allowed to emit as BMW manufacturing in Germany is, let's say, a million tons of greenhouse gases, okay? But if you, as BMW Germany, exceed the million tons, you have to find a way 
to negate, to offset that excess. So for example, BMW emits 1.5 million tons, but it was given a cap of 1 million tons, meaning it has to offset how much? 0 0.5 million, because it has exceeded the limit of 1 million by half a million tons. So what, that, what then does BMW do? What BMW has to do in principle is to go to the market and look for something, someone or an entity basically, who has half a million tons of carbon credits, which were generated from one of the very many types of carbon projects. For example, they could come to Kenya, where Chulu Hills or many Chulu, I mean Chulu, Chulu Hills is doing a, a Red Plus program, and they have a half, they have managed to capture half a million tons of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. So Chulu Hills will then sell BMW those half a million tons, their better amounts, to BMW. In the process of them selling, those half a million tons are sold in the form of a credit, which when BMW purchases those credits worth half a million tons can go back to Germany and tell the German regulator, hey, we purchased half a million tons of greenhouse gases from somewhere in Kenya, and we're here to now offset it. So you can see the two terms more or less imply the same. However, to be very specific, the offset implies the amount of greenhouse gas that you have to remove from the atmosphere. And now the credit means that commodity, because you see, if you're trading in something, that's in the form of a commodity. So that commodity in the form of abetted greenhouse gases, sequestered greenhouse gases, what we now call a credit. If somebody has understood, I want them to unmute their mic and tell me that I understood and then I ask them a question. That's one person, first to Mike, first to Mike. Kindly, kindly Charles, can you just repeat, if you don't mind? To okay. Just slowly repeat the, the Chulu example and the two million, uh, <laughs> whatever credit points. Okay, okay, fine. L let, let me use another, let me, let me just use a, a, a forest example, okay? Okay. A typical tree, for example, uh, in its lifespan can, of course, trees, they tend to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, okay? So let's say this particular tree, is, let's say it's, uh, let me give an example of eucalyptus, okay? So let's say the eucalyptus tree is able to remove uh, 10 tons of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere, one particular tree as an example. Of course, the amount of uh, greenhouse gas that any given tree can absorb from the atmosphere depends on the species, location, maturity, and so many other factors. So this is just an example. Don't, don't spot, okay? Just an example. So let's say you have a farm of, let's say, eucalyptus with, let's say, a thousand trees. And let's say in one year, each tree can remove 10 tons of greenhouse gas, of course, in this case, it will be CO2 from the atmosphere. So your farm with a thousand trees will be having, it will have managed to sequester 10 times a thousand trees, which is 10,000 tons of greenhouse gas. Are we together to that point? Yes, we are yes. Good. yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm, using, I'm, I'm using a very rudimentary example. Okay. For, for explanation purposes. Again, I repeat the amount of tons or the amount of greenhouse gas captured by any tree will be dependent on a number of factors. So, this is just for demonstrative purposes. So, this owner of this farm, let's call it Charles's farm. Charles's farm has a thousand trees. And theoretically, let's say one tree will be able to capture. 10 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. So we are saying in any given year, Charles farm or forest project will have been able to capture 10,000 tons of CO2E. Are you together? Now, from the guidelines given by the UNFCC, because UNFCC is the one who 
pioneer this whole framework, the guideline says for every one ton of greenhouse gas that you have sequestered or you have captured from the atmosphere, every one ton of CO2 e is equivalent to one carbon credit. It's a one to one ratio. So going to the example of Charles's forest, it then means if Charles is able to capture 10,000 tons of CO2e from atmosphere, then it means that Charles' farm has 10,000 credits. Are we clear? Uh, yes. Yes, 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 very good. So let's now go back to the example of the BMW. BMW was told by the government, you can do your manufacturing the way you see fit, and we're giving you a cap, a limit of 1 million tons of production of greenhouse gas, beyond which if you exceed that cap, you have to offset. So in my example, BMW uh, emitted 1.5 million tons, meaning it has exceeded by a half a million tons, yes? Are you together? Yes. yes. So my question to anyone, how many carbon credits does BMW Germany have to purchase? In other words, half a ton. Never supposed to ask to 0.5. Hey, kuna, kuna 0 0.5 billion. Half a million carbon half credits. A million. Thank you. So why are we saying BMW has to purchase half a million carbon credits? Why? Because it because exceeded it the limit exceeded. that it was given. Thank you. But the right answer, the perfect answer, the scientific answer is because it has to offset, offset <laughs> half a million. Good. For, for Kenyans, I'll use the example, your Fuliza limit is 5,000 and you have used it. So the next time you put m -Pesa into your phone, you have to accept that 5,000 Fuliza that you spent, which was not yours, or you are not, you are authorized, but you had to make sure you pay it back. So if a company is given a limit and exceeds the limit, it has to offset the amount of greenhouse gas that's emitted by an equivalent amount of carbon credits. And one ton, one ton is actually a thousand kilograms. Are you together? Yes, yes. mathematics. One ton of greenhouse gas has an equivalence to one carbon credit. Let me write it there on the chat box. One ton of GHG is equals one carbon credit. I've written it down there. Can you see? Yeah, in the chat it box? is even it's under carbon credit, yeah. Yes, and now to be to be to be more more scientific, the, when you're going through these uh, reports and uh, journal, this the technical jargon, you'll see this. Let me just write what you're going to see. Are you see that one T C O two E is equal to one carbon credit? Ladies and gentlemen, are we together? Yes. Yes, we are together, Charles. Yeah. Yes. So I, I will be very happy to say that is the end of the conversation, but it's not. I've just explained to you the mathematical or the scientific uh, explanation of how you get these carbon credits and how it's equivalent to the greenhouse gases. Are we together so far? Because if you're not together, I, I don't want to proceed. If somebody has a question on this, please either do an, an, an inbox question or you and which one I can ask, because this, this is basically where the carbon market starts. I have a question, Charles. Yes. Uh, the last equation you've written says one, I would read, I would read it as one ton of carbon, uh, of CO2 equivalent is equals to one carbon credit. But then now yes. what, what's in the case of uh, methane that is not, uh, 
Yes. What happens if we have methane as 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 the gas in discussion here, not CO2? Yes. Very good. Very good. That was, Very that good. was also my that was also my concern. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So now I, I I'm going to type something in the chat box and I want to see. So let's say uh, I, I've used the example of uh, a dairy kettle in Kenya. Yes. Okay. So we are saying uh, one dairy kettle. I'm typing just one dairy kettle emits, I'll say emits as equals, emits 54 kg of CH4. Methane. Are you seeing that? One dairy kettle is equal to 54 kilograms of methane. Okay? Are you to that point? And we're saying one CH4, the, we're saying the GWP 100 of CH4 is equals to 25 in my gay example. Please, I don't want to, to text anything in the chat box until I, I finish showing this explanation. And of course, I'm going to share the PowerPoints, but the PowerPoint will be pointless if you don't understand now. So please stop texting in the chat box. Uh, okay, so we are saying one kettle emits 54 kilograms of methane. Uh, the, the person asked the question, it was Magdalene. Please say yes if you are together. One dairy kettle is equal to 54 kilograms of methane, yes? Yes, we are together. Okay. I'm and saying, anything, yeah. Okay, and now we are saying the global warming potential every 100 years of methane is, 20, is 25, yes? Mm -hmm. Are you together? So yeah. we are then saying one CH4 is equals to 25 equivalent of CO2. Are you together up to there? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, so we are then saying one dairy kettle will be emitting 54 times 25, uh, how much is this? 54 times 25, which is uh, 1,350 kg CO2E. So one day the kettle, will be emitting 1,350 kilograms of CO2E equivalent. Are we together? I, I think it was Magdalene. Uh, yes, we are together. Yes. Uh, Glo global, warming, global warming potential of CH4 in terms of its equivalence to carbon dioxide is 25. So for every one kilogram of methane emitted, it's going to be equivalent to 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And if you are saying one dairy kettle is emitting 54 kilograms of methane, it means by equivalence, it's emitting 1,350 kilograms yeah, of CO2. Yeah, okay? understood. So now let's convert the kilograms to tons. And then we're saying 1,350 kilograms is equals to 1.35 tons CO2. Are we together? Yes, we are together. So we are saying one kettle right. is emitting 1.25 tons, theoretically, is an example. Are you together? And remember, if, if, if I can just go back to the, the PowerPoint I was showing on GWP, the GWP is given in different base years. 20, 100, 50, and so forth. So when it comes to the carbon credit conversation, when you're coming down to the calculation of emission reduction, we use the base years 100 because any carbon project that's going to be undertaken, it must be able to guarantee that the abatement of the methane is going to be 100 years. Can someone please mute the, the mic? Please mute the mics. Only unmute if, if you, I can see several mics are on, please mute the mics. Eh? Again, I repeat, when it comes to carbon project development and you're dealing with methane, the requirement is you have to demonstrate that your methane can be abated for 100 years, not 20, not 500, but 100 years. So that's why we use GWP 100, not GWP 20 or GWP 500. And as you can see, the lower you go in terms of the number of years, it's your base year, the potential is higher. If you look at methane, it's at a two, if you're under GWP 20, but it's 100, which is what the carbon market wants, it's going to be about 29 and so forth. But now, now this calculation usually you, you engage Charles, carbon. Please, sir. Hello? 
on can you please circle on uh, or or even show your highlight better especially on this slide this is where i think i've, I've grasped the list <laughs> the list okay, okay. yeah okay, when you're thinking share. about it you can circle or something okay no 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 not it not it uh -huh. um can you guys see can you guys see yes we yeah. can see can. yes okay let me do okay so you can see the the the, the column where i've circled ch4 before cell is uh, so this oops, wait, uh, just a minute Just a minute. I have circled on fossil, but for me, for if you're dealing with cows, just a minute. I'm trying to note it again. Yeah. Okay. So I was I was saying that uh, if you are dealing with um, a carbon project that engages in livestock methane, then you have to show that your project will guarantee the sequestration of that methane for. 100 years. You may think 100 years is long, but actually a typical lifespan of a carbon project is 20 to 30 years. So it's not that long. Meaning if let's say you're doing mangrove, I'll use the example of the mangrove project in Kwale County, it started in 2012 and the lifespan is 20 years. So the, it's supposed to end in the year 2032 and they have the option of extending it again. So because we the, the, there's a principle called permanence, which I'll talk about it later in the conversation. Any carbon project that is saying it's capturing um, it's, or it's sequestering uh, the greenhouse gases, it must have the element of permanence. You cannot do a project that is going to sequester a thousand tons, and then next month, the captured uh, greenhouse gas goes back to the atmosphere. No, we must have permanence. So if you're doing a livestock methane, the methodology and you're going to deploy must clearly demonstrate you sequester that methane for a hundred years. And there are people who do that assurance. We are going to talk about them as you come to section two. Yeah, section two or three. Yes. But I, I just wanted to, to give you the example of how you convert non-CO2 gases to become equivalent. You simply look at uh, which gas you're dealing with, and then you pick the corresponding value, and then you multiply it. The person who asking the question, is that point very clear? The question I would ask, the question yes. I would ask, when we are converting uh, for a daily data, we say it is 25, but I can see what you have uh, circled is 27.2. Point two, can you clarify for us to understand? Okay, thank you, thank you. So the values I was using was based on the IPCC guidelines of 2202, but this one is now for, uh, this one should have come out in 2022. The values are usually revealed periodically by the IPCC. That is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's a UN FCC body. However, that is clear. But whichever the value is, whenever you're doing the carbon project development, you always have to refer to the IPCC guidelines and get the exact value for the exact GWP and for the exact gas. I, is that point uh, clear? The one was asked. Yes, thank you. Yeah, IPC, let me just type IPCC. Ah, yeah. And then I can also see uh, there's a question from Richard. Yes, I am familiar with the Bumitra, market, the, the Bumitra um, workshop. I, I, I want to explain the difference here. There's a difference between what you call the duration of the carbon project and what you call the global warming potential. Now, remember, 
the what you've been saying for Bomita was dealing with the forest program and forests, when it comes to greenhouse gases, they're dealing with carbon dioxide. And because carbon dioxide is the baseline here, then the GWP factor will not be involved. GWP factor becomes important when you're dealing with gases which are other than CO2. But yes, a typical, can please someone with the mics? It's very annoying. Okay, Mike. So a typical forest program, yes, the first cycle is 10 years, and then you can have it renewed for another 10 years. You can renew a program depending on the type of project for, for two times, or rather twice or thrice. So yes, a typical forest program will be 10 years in the case of the, the trees done by Bumitra. However, and I want to be very clear. When I'm talking about 100 years, we are not, I'm not saying the project will run for 100 years. No, I'm saying if you are claiming you are sequestering CH4, N2O, or these other gases which are not CO2, the methodology has to clearly show that the permanence will be there for 100 years. Richard, um, is my point clear? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Your, yeah, yeah, your point is clear. I just wanted to ask one question there. I was uh, kicked out by the internet a few minutes. Uh, I will not want to take you back, but just one question. Well, again, why are we working on 100 years? And my question is, uh, 100 years sounds a little bit scary. Because uh, when you look at the, <laughs> the, the lifespan of a human yes. being, and I'm getting into this, and I'm talking over 100 years. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> so, is... so, yes, I, I understand the question. Mother. So yes, I, I get your question. OK, I, 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 again, let me say two statements, OK? Number one, a typical carbon project, OK? A typical carbon project has a particular lifespan. That is, when I, I say lifespan, I mean, the number of years from which you are able or you're allowed to you're allowed to capture carbon dioxide and claim your credits. Forest, the first cycle will be 10 years. In the case of the among group, it can even be the 20 years. In the case of uh, if you're coming to, to cook stoves, I'll get to the cook stoves later, but it can also be about 10 or 14 years for the first cycle. Okay. So don't confuse when you're talking about global warming potential, which is a different conversation to the lifespan of the project. However, because of the principle of permanence, the way in which you're going to be claiming you're removing methane or N2O or sulfur dioxide, et cetera, the permanence has been given a permanence of about 100 years. And I know we might not be able to live that long, but that ability to ensure it's, it's able to be there for a, 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 a hundred years is usually captured in the methodology. I will explain what you mean by methodology. You see, the way you do a carbon project for, let's say, a forest yeah. will be different from, let's say, renewable energy. Similarly, if you are doing a reforestation project, it's going to be different from afforestation. Why? Because afforestation, you are, you, you, you are simply trying to put uh, or rather to plant a new forest in a place where there's no forest. And deforestation, we are simply trying to restore the lost or chopped down forests. So this issue of GWP, it usually comes into play when you're dealing with greenhouse gases that are not carbon dioxide. And the methodology, usually you have to involve a person who's in carbon development, then they show you exactly how it's going to be done. Okay, so it's not about you living for hundred years. No, it's about and you also, making sure. Just yes, you making sure that that gas that is captured will be there for this duration, and that is usually done scientifically. And it's it's it's, it's a bit technical. I won't want to get into that, but we can have a session on let's say livestock, a session on forest, and we see how exactly the technology is going to be deployed. I, I hope the person who asked the question is uh, is satisfied with the answer. For now, I'm good. I'm good. I'm yes. good, Charles. Thank uh, you. Also, also, Charles, to add on that, uh, I find this information to be very, very much crucial, especially when it comes to the study of nexus of the resources like water, energy, and food. Uh, the global warming potential becomes handy because it helps in projecting 
uh, when is this period going to occur and what is going to affect? That is very great. Thank you. Yes, I hope it's very clear. I can see there's somebody who has asked me to try and quantify the amount of credits from a million trees. I, I, will, I will not answer that question because I will read various questions. What type of a forest program is it? Is it agroforestry, afforestation, avoided conversion? Which trees are there, or the region, and so forth? At the end of this uh, session, I'll be able to share my email. Then I can answer those very specific questions. But for today, remember, I wanted to deal with the, what you call beginner's guide. Because if I come down to the level of uh, explaining the, the the, or, or if you come down the level of explaining the different kinds of projects and in terms of quantification, there's usually a particular formula involved. And I, I won't want to get that technical level. Maybe perhaps I can liaise with the Nana and we can have those different projects sessions for maybe forest people, people in agriculture, people in let's say renewable energy. We can have those more technical descriptions. But in a nutshell, the, the 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 quantification can be calculated and how you calculate it, how you calculate the potential of a of a tree to sequester carbon it's usually simple and also technical it involves a random sampling of the trees within the the, the land because the land can be millions of acres so you do random sampling and then in the, within the sample plots you measure the width at the gut of the tree at the height you you get to know the maturity of the year the tree the the species because all this will go towards you to able to calculate the above ground biomass and the below ground biomass, which will not speak towards the amount of carbon dioxide. So I cannot answer and give you a figure of 1 million trees. I hope, Joseph, I'm clear on that. And then there's a question from, um, oh, I have a, uh, from Anne. Anne is asking question, what, does G, what does GTP mean? Just a minute. What does GTP mean? It simply means it's, it's a measure of temperature change at the end of that particular time period. Okay, the, the difference in the temperature, degree Celsius and whatnot, and then of a, of a given period. For example, if you're looking at uh, within 100 years of methane where, where I've circled, then the, the GTP, within 100 years, the temperature change will be 7.5 degrees, plus or minus something. Okay, but when, when you're coming to carbon markets, we focus on the GWP. Does somebody else with a question? Yeah, my question is I have this, one. Eh? Okay, um, I'll go after you. Okay, I want to ask. Eh? Yes, is the carbon uh, trading being done in Kenya, or it's, it is something that will come another day? I, uh, I'll, I, I, I'll tell you, my brother. People have been earning from carbon credits yes. for about ten years. I'm saying people have been earning money from carbon credits in the Republic of Kenya for over the last 15 years. It is there, it has been there for some time. It's not something new. However, as I said in the beginning, it's just a question of awareness. The voluntary carbon market was operational from as early as around 205, 206. Okay? It has been there for, my, for yeah, it has been there. We, we, we will get down to how you, where you get the credits, how much the credits, where you sell that here for part of the session. I just wanted to make sure we understand what the credit is. So when I say one credit is, is what this amount of money, you get, you're able to relate. So about Tafika, yeah. If you looked at the, the program, we have four sessions. Yeah, so you take Kujia for session three. Yeah, two actually, yeah. Okay. There's another, there's a lady with a question. You've said it in session three. Let me wait. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 I asked for about uh, three hours because the one on one has to cover at least the basics in all the different things so she can understand. So, at least now when you're going out there to do your own self reading, you know where to focus on the reading. But yeah, we will definitely get there. So, I have a question. Yes. Uh, do we have a formula for calculating? The carbon sequestered maybe from an from a specific tree. The simple answer As is you know, the, the, the simple answer is yes. For any kind of carbon project, uh -huh. depending on what you call a registry, 
there's a corresponding formula you're going to deploy. However, I'll come to that in session three. Or you are, oh, I have, I have, there's a way I plan we go systematically because I can't talk about the calculation of, uh, of carbocredits if the what I will keep it not very clear. What I just want to know right now, in terms of what a carbon credit is and what the equivalence between a carbon credit and in terms of tons of CO2E, if that point is clear, then I, is that point clear to everybody? Your point here, equivalence, one ton is equal to one carbon credit. Yes. 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 Okay. We are okay, Charles. Okay, yeah, yeah, and, and for, for, for the end time, yes, we are going to share the slides. Don't worry, but also just make sure you keep on, uh, what, do you, what, what do you call this? You keep on taking screenshots as I move, eh? At least Leo, just as soon as fill your phones with, uh, with something other than TikTok memes, if I can say that. Yeah, just keep on taking screenshots. Now, moving on, I'm sure you guys have heard eh? a, a company like Kenjin in Kenya, is also getting carbon credits, yeah? And you're wondering how? <clears throat> the simple answer is this. If you understand the whole process of how greenhouse gases are there in the atmosphere, then you must appreciate two things. Number one, you must appreciate that when you're doing a carbon project, you can either do a carbon project that's going to work towards removing what is already there, and number two, avoiding the emission of a greenhouse gas. So you either remove or you leave things as they are. In the case of Kenjin, with the, specifically with regards to the renewable energy generation by Kenjin, these microphones are becoming a nuisance. Please, Kindly don't, switch don't, off don't, your microphones. Please. Yeah, please, 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 please. In fact, you shouldn't be talking to anybody right now, wherever you are. Spouse, child, whoever, please focus on this for the next remaining time to Malaysia, and then you can go to other things. Eh? Focus on this. By the time I'm done with this thing, you'll see that all of you are sitting on, my, on, on gold mines, literally. But for you to understand, please focus. Stop with the mic, stop whatever you're doing, just focus. Just bear with me for the next hour or so. Now, going back to Kenjen. Kenjen, once upon a time, used to generate electricity from fossil fuels. How? It will use diesel to power the turbines that are going to be pushing the, the water within, let's say, the hydropower stations, okay? However, because of, of the vision to dispatch and whatnot, Kenyan began to what, to what we call cleaning the grid to make sure we're generating power from clean energy sources. For example, we have wind turbines in Turkana, we have got the geothermal wells all over Rukaria, we have got something coming up in Northern Eastern on, on solar. Don't ask me what, but yes, something else is coming up from there and so forth and so forth. So because Kenjian is now able to generate electricity by avoiding the emission of greenhouse gases, it is also entitled to carbon credits. Yes, why? Because we are trying to thank people or are trying to incentivize companies and entities that are working towards mitigating global warming. Because remember, Kenjin had the option of using diesel to turn the, the machines, but no, they're going to avoid the using of diesel and instead use wind and hence generate the electricity. And because of its avoiding the emission, it is also entitled to carbon projects. Are we clear on that point? And if you're not aware, uh, the, the last time I checked, in the last two, three years, Kenyan got almost 400 million shillings from the sale of carbon credits, what you call REC, Renewable Energy Certificates. It's a, it's a specific uh, term for the kind of credit it gets from Renewable Energy, REC, REX. Is there a question on that before I proceed? Charles, there is no question. We want you to move faster so that we could, we could uh, ask the questions later because just okay. like you say, we are anxious now and we are getting uh, excited. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so so I think by now, if you've understood how we, we, you're able to, to, 
to sell your carbon assets or carbon credits to a company like BMW in Germany, if you go about the example I used, then by now you're able to see the importance of carbon markets and how it goes towards mitigating climate change. I am using the word mitigating. I hope we all know the difference between adaptation and mitigation. I will not get into that, but please uh, just try and know the, 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 the difference. And of course, uh, I, I, I don't want to mention specific projects in the country, but I'll just give a description of a project because I can't speak on, another, on behalf of another company without a permission. I don't want to be misquoted. But there's a particular cook stove, Jiko. There's a particular cook stove in the country, in, in Kenya, that's using bioethanol fuel to have that flame. And the particular Jiko is blue in color. I think you all know what I'm talking about, yes? So that is also a, a carbon project on the simple fact that uh, Mrs. Waweru or, or, or Shesho Waweru had the option of cooking using charcoal or firewood, but now the carbon developer is saying, hey, instead of using charcoal and firewood, use my unique GCO that runs on bioethanol fuel. Hence, we are saying Shosho Waweru is able to avoid the emissions of greenhouse gases through the use of a GECO that runs on bioethanol, if it's done from sugar cane. Okay, so that's just an example of the importance of carbon markets in mitigating climate change. We are offering solutions to the communities to change or other alternative fuel or, or rather a, a different ways of doing things away from bio, from the business as usual. So of course, all this uh, I'll, I'll share this. This is just a thing on policy. I want to get to the to the meat of things. I think by now we, we understand uh, what you mean by carbon neutrality, and of course by now you should understand the different ways in which you can achieve carbon Yo. neutrality. This is a Yeah, kunya mas kunya rajwa. Can you please switch off your mic? I will just say never. So I've removed the rights for uh, audience to, to unmute until when it is time for questions. So how do you achieve carbon neutrality? I gave the example of BMW Germany, how they can make sure they can negate the amount of uh, emissions, I think through carbon projects. And of course, there's an issue of uh, behavioral change and of course, policy measures. And a policy measure can be in, in different ways, it can be a total ban or a reduced ban. For example, those in Kenya, you can remember during the Michuki era, when we were talking about burning of plastic bags, we, we gave the manufacturers about three, four, five years to stop manufacturing and then to replace plastic bags with now these woven bags. That's an example of policy. But if whether or not the policy is working, that is not for today's discussion. So I'll move on quickly. Is there a question up to that point? Before now, we get to a regulatory framework where we're going to be looking at who is this person yes. or this entity that is going to give me carbon credits? Is there any question? Let me check in the chat box. Yes, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, can you can you uh, just go again on how BM, BMW can uh, get uh, to carbon neutrality? Thank you. Come again. Can you just uh, uh, repeat? Come again mm -hmm. on how the BMW can uh, get to carbon neutrality. Okay. So, for example, if I'm BMW, uh, let, let me just go one by one. Uh, so, for BMW, it has got two ways. Number one, remember we, we were talking about BMW having the offsets, the, the half a million tons that exceeded the, the, <laughs> the government limits. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll have to start kicking out uh, people. Yeah, I'll have to start kicking out people because it's, it's becoming a nuisance. Okay, so going back to the question of BMW, there are two ways. Number one, about the offset, because it's exceeded the limits, then BMW can simply come to the market and purchase these credits. Where this market is and how the credits are, are issued, it's part of session two, so I don't want to get into that. Option number two is BMW in itself can also have the option of being an investor in carbon project development. And I shall talk about uh, that in line with what my company will do. 
in terms of how we look for manufacturers and, and industries within the European markets who are looking to either finance projects as a way of them achieving their carbon neutrality. So there are different ways the BMW can, 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 can use them being a manufacturer. Next question. Is there another question? I saw I saw in the in the yes, chat, I have a question. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's in the chat box. Eh? Um, yes. uh, could you kindly clarify uh, what's the difference between a carbon offset and the so-called greenwashing? Okay. Uh, okay. 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 I. 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 That's. Uh, how, how? Okay. You see, greenwashing. I, I don't be misquoted, but there, there, there are companies who are heavy emitters, and so they come to the markets to to look for the credits because they have clearly been they have exceeded their their, their amount of uh, emissions, and so then to come to the market to to negate it. Think of, for example, of a company somewhere that's its main source of energy is coal. Yes, so think of a company somewhere where for it to undertake its manufacturing process, it must rely on coal. I think you know what coal is, yeah? So then this company comes to the market to say, uh, to, to, to look for Charles Forest or whatever it is, to buy these credits so it can then go and say, hey, in as much as, as emitting greenhouse gases from my coal, coal uh, business, I have bought these credits to offset what I was doing. So technically, that can be considered as a form of greenwashing. So it then becomes a, an ethical issue, or uh, yeah, it's, it's a question of ethics. Should we allow such companies to merely buy carbon credits as an option or as a reason for them to keep on using coal? The simple answer is no. The way the voluntary carbon market is structured, we are trying to tell companies, when I say we, I mean like the industry, not me as Charles, but we are trying to say companies that are relying on fossil fuel should undertake what we call fuel switch. But for you to tell a company in South Africa that's generating electricity from coal to switch from coal to let's say hydro, you're looking at millions and millions or even billions of dollars of investment. So they will also tell you, hey, I understand, but we can't do it immediately because of the capital investment that has been put into, into, uh, into this. So yeah, we, it, it's, a, it's a question of ethics. And at the same time, it's a question of them saying, hey, this is the much you can do, okay? Are we, are we together? Uh, any other question? So I have a question. I don't know whether you can get me clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my, my question gets back to the BMW uh, example that you gave out of them being allowed to emit 2 million tons of, uh, of carbon. Mm -hmm. And then if they emit more than 2 million tons, that is 2.5, they need to look for uh, someone involved in projects that sequesters the 0 0.5 million uh, carbon from the tons of carbon from the atmosphere, right? Yes, yes. So it comes here. So uh, what happens to the two million tons that they've already emitted by atmosphere? So how is it being dealt with? Very, and very how uh, what yes. those strategies and? that the government or rather better use to mm. give those limits? Okay. First thank of you. all, thank you. That's a very good question. So first of all, these limits I'm talking about they're, they're mostly in non-African markets. That is mostly looking at. Uh, we're looking at European, the US, North America, uh, UK and Australia. Why? It, it, it goes down to session two, where we shall look at how did now the carbon market exactly in terms of legal framework come about. Remember the, the thing I was talking about, Alpha, global warming, and now we have got things like Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, COP, it, it, it goes back to that. So African governments are not under such an obligation. This usually is, a, is a, what you call cap and trade, uh, framework within European markets, where because they're heavy emitters, by the, by the mere fact they're industrial, industrial nation, industrialized nations, they have got those limits on their on their on their on their companies. Now, what happens about that emissions they have done? Remember, I've told you 
it's all about trying to strike a balance between industry, industrial growth, and also human living stroke mother nature. So their own governments usually give them a limit because the industry simply has to emit. There's, there's no way uh, a car manufacturer will fail to emit because when you talk about renewable energy, not all car manufacturers have managed to do the switch. However, a long-term strategy is usually to encourage companies, especially I, I, I'm using the example of um, coal-powered plants to do what you call fuel. See, it's a very big thing. It's a very expensive procedure, okay? But that now becomes an issue within their respective uh, policy and national regulations. And also in session two, you learn to understand why I keep on referring to the voluntary carbon market. Why do I keep on saying the VCM? VCM? I'll, I'll explain why once we get to it. But the long and short of it is that usually comes down to uh, the, the national policy of the respective country. So EO, it's, they, they, they have a way of themselves squaring it out. So and so has emitted this amount, then how do they still negate it? One way I know most companies do is they invest in these carbon projects within here in Africa. Because in as much as Africa has a lot of space for a number of carbon projects, we lack finances. Doing a typical carbon project, even a mere feasibility study, it's millions of near shillings. It, it's, not, it's not cheap. It's costly. So some of the things that happens is we have these people, they come here, the how, I'll explain it uh, later in session three, but yeah. Uh, is there any question if there's none? Yeah, I have a question. Um, yes. Thank you for the presentation so far. I think it's very enriching. Uh, I'm just wondering how a company can actually achieve a carbon neutrality claim. And the reason I'm wondering that uh, in your earlier explanation, you indicated that uh, the different uh, scope one, scope two, scope three type of contribution to emissions that we we normally, that, that, that the categories, and uh, there's only a limit to which uh, I can be able to uh, control my contribution to, um, I mean, my, my emissions. So for example, yes, directly I can reduce my footprint as a company, but indirectly I'm also buying cars that are using um, uh, things that have been manufactured in somewhere else where the carbon emission has not been calculated. So how can I go, how can I be able to make a claim that I'm actually carbon neutral? Yes, okay. It's a very good question, and, and, and it's more on policy and uh, verification. Up, up on audit board, I can see the mic. I hope you can hear me. Yes, you're audible, child. Okay, okay. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a policy question and it's, it's a verification question. You remember when I talked about carbon footprint? So for you as an individual, for you to be able to, to know your amount of emissions, you literally have to calculate. Right now, there are some. Um, I can say some small apps. When I say small, I mean they're not very accurate because when you're calculating the amount of emissions that you as an individual are responsible for, or even a company, it's, it's a technical process. There is a lot of calculation, uh, assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So they are for a, at the individual level, there are these apps in the Google Play Store or wherever they say, oh, we're able to calculate your carbon footprint. They're there. How accurate they are, I, I, I can't speak to that. But then when it comes to, let's say, the, the, these companies and whatever they're doing, I understand the fact that uh, the ideal scenario is that uh, companies should not at any point in time be emitting greenhouse gases. That fact is very clear. However, we have to understand something. And this is why I said that we have to strike a balance between industrialization of the economy and mother nature. These companies remember there's a lot of capital investment in them undertaking a project, okay? So the most they can do is to start what you call the transition. I'm sure I've heard of a phrase like energy transition. They can start the project of that transition. However, it's not something that will happen in one, two, five years, no. It's a very slow and gradual process. Even the case of Kenjen, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't get to where we are. The grid emission factor of Kenya is like 0 0.2, meaning it's very, 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 very clean. The amount of energy contribution of, of renewable energy into a grid is 84%. 
but we didn't just wake up and find ourselves there. It took a lot of investments. Kenjan took green bonds to start phasing out the diesel and investing in this other renewable energy project. So it, it's it's a it's a long process. How how we as end users can benefit, and and this is where now it comes to the the case of uh, financing in carbon project development is, if you are an innovator or an owner of a carbon asset, and you know that through the selling of a product you are going to be generating carbon credits, which are going to be getting money. If we want to encourage, let's say, Charles to stop using uh, firewood and to now be using an improved cook stove or an electric cook stove, then there are some things you can do. One of the projects we are doing with some of our partners is, is it's in regards to electric cook stoves. We are trying to tell people to stop relying on, let's say, the, 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 the what we call this, the, the charcoal and the firewood and even LPG. It's not so clean, yes? So how do we tell, how do we convince a buyer? A typical electric cook stove that is of good international standards will be costing about 15,000 Kenya shillings. It is expensive, fact. But when I'm doing the, the carbon project development for that particular cook stove, I'm able to do some calculations and know in the, in the space of 20 years, this project, if we deploy, let's say, X number of cook stoves across the country or the continent, we are going to get X number of carbon credits. I then look for an investor to purchase them in advance, what you call for purchases, which I'll talk about in section four. Then I take that advance payment, I go back to manufacturing and improve the design and bring down the cost of that electric cook stove, number one, for example. So we, we, we're talking about capex, the capital expenditure. We bring it down. So as we can convince this end user to stop using LPG or to stop using Maca. Now this is how, what you can do as an individual you buy these new products which are coming in the markets. But then if you're looking at the case of an electric cook stove, it brings bring another problem. What about the issue of electricity tariffs? Not a problem. In any business, there's what you call CAPEX and OPEX. OPEX now coming to, it speaks towards, um, or it speaks towards reducing the operational cost of operating a device. So we can have part of the money from the carbon credits goes towards reducing the energy expenditure from this person. I use an example that the government of Kenya is doing. I'm sure you guys had the president, uh, president of Kenya, President Ruto, talking about electric border borders, going to specific electric charging stations where the charge that the cost of one cloth per hour is eight shillings. Right now, one cloth per hour is almost 30 shillings. So he's saying this border border guys will be charging at eight shillings. You are wondering, I in it or is a Java or is this actually true? It is possible because the person who designs this particular border borders will be able to estimate the number of credits to be gotten from the project in, in less than 10 or 20 years, do a forward purchase on an ERPA, I'll talk about that later, get money. The right money will be going towards, let's say one, reducing the cost of the Borobora, and two, paying Kenya power for the difference in which this Borobora rider is, is, is using the steamer. So for example, where the Borobora rider was to pay 30 shillings per kilowatt hour, but it's not being paid, it's only paying eight shillings, then the project developer will not be paying the difference of the two shillings. Is act as an incentive to you as an individual to stop using a, a combustion engine border border and use an electric one. So that's how you, we, you as an individual can do. If you see the opportunity as an individual, you can do it. Companies, it's more take, take more, it's more complex because there's an initial investment they did for for the, the company. I, I I hope that point is clear. That point is clear. The grid emission factor for Kenya is about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. It's very low, meaning it's very, 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 very clean. In other countries, it's just crazy. I won't mention which countries. Yeah, it's a public forum, but yeah. So allow me to now quickly move through session two. And then if I've got any other question, you can either write it down or put it in the chat box. And then I will, I will, I will get to you. So I, I will move very fast when it comes to international agreements. And I take you back to the beginning when I mentioned about the issue of, uh, let me just mute all mics, just a minute. I'll admit the mics once I'm done with the section to avoid interruptions. So when now the world were beginning to listen to the scientific community and understand, yeah, yeah, there's actually global warming. Then the question was, how do we go about this? Because remember, we have got countries who don't do any much, uh, any much uh, in terms of, uh, industrialization, like countries in Africa, in the down south, and the countries are very, very good 
in manufacturing and industrialization in the Europe and whatnot. So we began having these conversations in what we are calling now the, the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol was how can we develop mechanisms to oversee the abatement of greenhouse gas emissions by the different countries depending on where they are. I'll be very slow in explaining one mechanism which came from Kyoto because one of the mechanisms or some of the mechanisms from Kyoto are still in existence and will help you understand the example I was giving on BMW, for example, in Germany. And, and for, for the sake of, of litigation and on my part, me, BMW is a fictional company that's not in existence for the sake of uh, <clears throat> examples. So within the Kyoto uh, protocol and uh, conversations, three mechanisms came up. Let me see if uh, I have a diagram. Okay, see my diagram. Okay, no problem. So in the case of Kyoto, there are three mechanisms which were developed. One was called, please take a screenshot. And also if you can write this down, you can do more Wikipedia or Google search on these three mechanisms, just to have a good understanding of the different mechanism. One mechanism was called the emissions trading system, which now allows countries or people like BMW to have that, that trade between, uh, I'm looking for offsets, where do I get the credit? So that was called the emissions trading system. And one of the most comprehensive and effective ETS or emission trading system in the world is the one within the European Union. It's called EU ETS, European Union Emissions Trading System. It allows countries within European Union to trade. I think you guys know that countries, that the, the Nordic countries, like in Sweden, Norway, they have got a lot of renewable energy, so they have got the renewable energy certificates which can, they, they can easily sell to other countries which are still having using that grid, which are not mentioned. So of course, visa. But anyway, moving on, the second mechanism that the, the Kyoto Protocol developed, and this is where now Kenya as a country falls in, is called the Clean Development Mechanism. And another one where a country like <clears throat> Germany will be involved is called the Joint Implementation. By my statement already, it should be clear that the mechanism developed by the Kyoto Protocol were what we're going to call the compliance mechanism, and it was supposed to be a government to government affair. Umbuka Hapa, we're looking at the early 2000s. The, 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 the kind of market that my company I operate in came later. I mean, the voluntary carbon market. This is what we call the compliance market, where the government of Kenya, the government of Tanzania, the government of UK, and whatever, they had to participate in all of these markets. The question is, what was the difference? So they classified countries into two groups. The first group and next one were countries which were developed, who, because they were very industrialized, they had to find a way to offset and mitigate their emissions by buying credits coming from developing countries. So as we are telling Kenya, okay, me as UK, I understand I emitted, so I do, you know what, Kenya? Kenya, you do some projects, couple of projects, then as the UK government will come and buy these credits from the Kenyan government. For, so in the case of Kenyan government, it will be something like Kenyan. So when Kenya is selling its credits, in principle, it will be selling the credits from the Kenyan government through Kenyan to another government, let's say within the CDM framework. I hope that point is very clear. Here we're looking at government to government affairs, okay? So the clean development mechanism was in principle for developing countries like Kenya to come up with carbon projects and sell those credits to European countries, countries in the Annex One, so as they can go ahead and mitigate their climate projects. That one should be clear. However, there's another concern. A country like, let's say Norway say, hey, but also we have got carbon projects we can sell, but you know what? Let's sell among us as developed countries. So another mechanism which is also developed was called the Joint Implementation, GI, whereby it is the countries in Annex One, the developed countries will be now be trading among us one another. So we are saying instead of the UK always coming to Africa, it now had a problem, had an option of, let's say, going to Sweden, who have got credits from, let's say, renewable energy to buy from them. So that was now what we call the, the Kyoto Protocol. Before I proceed, 
I want to ask if there's anyone with a question specifically with regard to the Kyoto Protocol, especially the clean development mechanism. Why I'm insisting is because some of the methodologies we're using in the country and in the continent or globally are within the clean development mechanism. And I'll explain why I, as a voluntary carbon market player, can still use a CDM methodology. I'll explain that by I. But I hope that the points on emissions trading, CDM, and JI are clear. This is now one of the platforms where the exchange of credits for money is going to be taking place. The first option is government to government. When Kenjen generates its credits, who does it sell it to? An Annex One country, UK, whoever it is, whoever. India, China, somebody wants to offset the emission. If the point is clear, somebody just tell me if it's clear. If it's not clear, somebody please put clear question. Specifically on Let's Kyoto clear, Protocol. Charles, let's move on. I think it's clear. We move on. And I have a comment clear. before I switch off. I have a comment before I switch off, Charles. Eh? Yes. Just to realize that the, when I look at the program, it looks a little bit uh, long, and uh, we are almost past two hours in it. I was just requesting, since it sounds very important, and there are also so many questions, we could move without questions until the end, then we can come back. And of course, there will be a time for you to share and even to engage later. But uh, I think it is important within, between now and four o'clock, at least we go through. Otherwise, I think we have taken longer and we have covered less, which is important because of uh, the, 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 the nature of the training and these are new things. Thank you for that comment. Okay, okay, I, I, I like that approach, so fine. So in case you have a, a, a question comes to mind, either you write it down if you're able to, or you can put in the chat box, and I'll, I promise you I'll make sure to go through question by question on the chat box to make sure everything is answered. And if your question is more technical, I'll also share my email addresses and contacts at the end of the conversation. Sour. Yeah, and I'm also seeing there's a request for part two. Yeah, we can do that, but because I already committed, let me just finish what I committed, and then we can always do a part two, and where, whereby I can focus on the carbon project development itself. But right now, I need to cover even the policy for people to understand. Anyway, moving on swiftly. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard of Paris. Now, there are some challenges with the Kyoto Protocol, with some money issues, legal issues, so we decided to have the, the Paris Agreements. And you can read more about the Paris Agreements, but the main thing I want to tell about the Paris agreements is with, with, with regards to what uh, the COP27 COP managed to agree. Because it was not very clear or why should we be classified as Annex 1, Annex 2 countries. So the Conference of Parties, that is COP, decided to begin to amend the, 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 the Kyoto Protocol and specifically, specifically Article 6. Article 6. Now, I, 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 I know there's a lot we can talk about this. We can spend a whole hour on Article 6. I will not want that. But it, it, I, I will put some of these resources and I'll share, I'll share with you what exactly Article 6 says. Briefly, let me just quickly share what it says. And then we, we won't talk much about this. But Article 6, it's, 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 it's simply has got, uh, it's, it's suggesting different ways in which governments can interact. And for those of you who have been curious as to why the president of Kenya, for example, has been pushing a lot of ways because the previous COP managed to do some good amendments. I can say it's, it's technically good amendments for Article 6, because it then enables more government, especially governments in Africa, to enhance trading in carbon, on, on the carbon credits. And remember, when you're trading in carbon credits, we are trading in, in, in a dollar currency. So you can imagine the amount of currency the government of Kenya or the government of Uganda, wherever, it will be getting in terms of the forex reserves. So uh, I'll also share a, a copy of the article six, or you can Google it. So let me just go quickly to my, to my presentation. The summary and the long and short of what the article six is saying, the three, the three key sub articles. So article 6.2, was basically proposing a mechanism that allows a country like Kenya to directly and easily reach out to let's say, the country of the, in the UK and trade in what we call ITMOs, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. For example, I have already told you Kenya's, uh, our, our climate, in as much as there's climate impact in Kenya, but ours in terms of greenhouse gases, it's less compared to let's say, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
um, China. Let me say PRC. So Article 2 talks about what you call ITMOs, International Transparent Mitigation Outcomes, which is saying the government of Kenya can develop these carbon projects voluntarily or at the nation state level and sell them to a country like PRC that is unable to, to it's unable to, to, to uh, what is this, to, to develop the project for, for whatever reason. But even better, when Kenya is selling these credits, it's not just selling them for the monetary gain, but as it's selling the credit, it's able to say, we managed to do projects that abetted a million tons of credits, put this credit as part of our NDC contributions, and also recognize that we are also going to do a form of sell. The how exactly is now going to discuss in the, the next scope in, in, in Dubai. Article 6.4, it's more or less what we have in the CBM, but the difference now is uh, the UN wants to make it more stringent, so as to cover some of the challenges within the carbon market, we shall we talk about, <clears throat> so we shall talk about later. But Article 6.4, it's more or less in the CDM playbook. And then Article 6.8 is simply talking about uh, non-market-based approaches. So this could be uh, the government of Kenya, you'll talk to the government of Germany, hey, Germany, please talk to GIZ and ask them to come to Kenya and do capacity building. For example, what you're doing today here is capacity building. We are building, I'm building capacity of the locals to know more work about projects. So the government of Germany can decide, instead of us putting money, we ourselves will come to the ground. And instead of giving the government of Kenya money, we shall be doing donations in the form of capacity building, knowledge sharing, technology sharing, et cetera, et cetera, for free as part of our mitigation contribution to the to African countries, okay? So I'll quickly move away from this. If there are any questions, you can ask me. So by now, I've, I've explained a lot about the compliance markets, CBM, JI, where governments to governments are interacting. However, people say that individual citizens might also want to come up with carbon projects because they own lands, their own technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So we must have a market where individuals like Vast Carbon can develop projects in, in wherever and participate in the, in, the, in, the, in the sale of carbon credits. And because I'm assuming most of you are not government or none of you is government of Kenya, if any of you or all of you want to do a carbon product development, then it will fall under the voluntary carbon market, which I shall always be calling VCM. And that's the market in which I operate from. So where then do you get your credits if you're from the voluntary market or even the compliance markets? So remember the CBM? So the CBM, each kind of market has its, its own unique naming for the carbon credits, but it all means the same thing. It's, it's think of it, um, it's like this full facility, Safara come and call it this way, Telecom and call it that way, and Airtel call it that way, but it's all full -iza. Okay, so in each market, in the compliance market, and there are several, so the CDM, they call it CDR. So if you go to the, the next COP, I'm going to come to the SCS conference in Nairobi in September, USKIA CR, it means Certified Emissions Reduction, which is basically the carbon credit, how it's referred to within the CDM. Okay, and then there's the, the, the JI, and the, this other Alberta, it's in Canada, and the US, and so on, so forth. Our point is clear. So it then means that if, if somebody, an entity, or let's say it's Kenyan government, is doing a project under the CDM and it wants to get credits, it goes to the CDM executive board for the certification. However, it does not go directly. The first thing is the government of Kenya has to have what you call a DNA, designated national authority. That is the entity which we shall be given the letter of authorization to Kenjen to undertake a renewable energy carbon project, which shall then be taken to the CDM executive board for certification and issuance of carbon credits. Here, that's the, 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 the basics of it. So CERs are issued by the CDM. So what about the voluntary market? Now, in the voluntary market, especially in Africa, there are three registries. There are three bodies 
that are responsible for the issuance of the carbon credits. They are the bodies whereby your project developer is going to develop your project, the proposal, and then he or she sends it to this particular entity and registers the program, and the program can go towards now the, the carbon project development cycle, which will be part of section three. I'll explain to you the, the eight stages and what needs to happen in each stage and how people like Baskabon can assist you to get there. So in a nutshell, if in Kenya and in Africa, the three main bodies, the gold standard, Plan Vivo, and Vera, or the Verified Carbon Standard. So each of them, they have got their own name for the, for the carbon credit, but it's the same, same thing, like I explained earlier. So the gold standard, they call it VER, Plan Vivo, they call it PVC, and Vera, they call it VCU. It all means the same thing, and each of the credits is equal to one ton of greenhouse gas. There's no difference. The difference is only in the naming. Hakuna Tokotingine. It's just the naming. And each of these three standards, they tend to have a speciality or a preference. However, because I'm a market player, I cannot tell you who's good, who's bad, because I personally interact with all the three standards and each of them have got their own strength. If you want to do a nature-based project, plan vivo. Plan vivo because they only do nature-based and they're very, very thorough. You'll go to plan vivo. If you want to do a project that has a lot of uh, in use of technology, digital MRV, you go to gold standards. But if you want to do a project across any of the categories, the Vera, Vera has got, in fact, the largest market, the, the largest uh, registry, we call them registries, is, is Vera, the verified carbon standards. But all of them have got their own strengths and their own weaknesses. I will not get into that. Now, besides the, the registries, they have got, they are, we have got three entities which have come up to help the development. In Africa, maybe some of you have heard of this, especially if you went to the, the previous COP, it, it's called ACME, African Carbon Market Initiative. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collection of guests from the UN government in, uh, in Africa, uh, technology providers. So many people have come and made this initiative and said, hey, we want to accelerate the growth of carbon project development. So if you're a carbon project developer like us, Carbon, you must make sure you, you work closely with ACME because they, they offer technical guidance, they offer so many assistance, depending on what you want. So we, we are very happy about ACME, it's still growing. The, web, the website is out, I'll be sharing those uh, resources, but you can also just look for africancarbonmarkets.org and, and read more about them. And some of these people like uh, GAPP, c 4 and UNECA, that they're, they're very good developing partners. Some are also the, the all based in Nairobi. And you can always reach out if you've got something. Another one is called VCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Initiative. It, they, they are also there to enhance integrity. I am sure you're wondering why you're talking about integrity. It's because in the, uh, in the early years of the VCM, people used to sell their credit twice. For example, Charles Forrest, he will sell the credits to to let's say BMW, and then you might want to sell the same credits to let's say Porsche or, or, or somebody else. So what we call double counting, yeah? So the entities like the VCMI, and I call uh, ICVCMI, who are uh, trying to bring more sanity, yeah? to bring more sanity into the market, especially the issue of integrity. You remember I mentioned something to do with permanence. If you are doing a forest program, and then there's a fire outbreak within the 10 years, you cannot get credits for the, the trees that got burnt. And if you get those credits, it's an integrity issue. You are, your project has a problem. And there are ways in which the carbon methodology accounts for leakage. That's what we call a leakage, where you are anticipating to do this carbon project, but because of one, two, three, you are not able to do it 100%. So there's, an, there's a leakage. And we shall look at the formula uh, later on. I just want to go to session three very fast. I hope you're taking pictures. And, and last but not least within this area, remember if you want to do a carbon project, I know some of us might be thinking of shortcuts, I can tell you for free. And if you're familiar with a project called NRT in Kenya, you might have heard there's a controversy and now the project, which was covering over 2 million hectares has been put on hold because of one, two, three issues. When we are doing a carbon project, there are what you call core carbon principles your project must adhere and follow some of these principles, rather all of these principles, especially on additionality, or appointment emissions impact, additionality, permanence, 
robust quantification, no double counting. Those small things, they can literally kill your projects for good. And once your project has been blacklisted for either of these four issues, you're done. Whether you go to Vera, you go to Plan Vivo, you are done. Okay? And this is where, if you want to do the second number of projects, you approach project developers to help you to avoid these things. I, 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 and I'll give you an example. You see the way people, once upon a time, they used to do something to the KPLC, KPLC meter, when I rule So it's not counting. Yeah? You try doing shortcuts, you are done. So these principles have to be adhered to. Now, we are coming to the end of session two, and then we go to session three. I'm sure most of you, at the beginning of the, of, of, when you woke up today, your, your main idea of carbon projects was forests. But ladies and gentlemen, there are hundred and different types of carbon credits or carbon projects in terms of topology. They could be renewable energy, household and community, chemical industries, energy efficiency, waste disposal, agriculture, transport, forestry. In fact, forestry was the pioneer, but now there are others. And I, I, I'll just give you an example of one in each. Um, if you look at renewable energy, I, this example of, of Kenjian, they do geothermal, they do solar, and they're also going to be doing, uh, they're also doing wind. If you come to household community, there's an the example of this uh, cook stoves I've been mentioning, the one using about ethanol, okay, that's falls under household and community. If you're coming to chemical industries, there, there are several. There's this new one called carbon capture storage. If I tell you, for example, there is a device that can literally suck carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combine it with sand, mineralize it, and store it underground forever and ever, would you believe it? It's called direct air capture. Yes, these are, these are new technologies. There is one company, uh, they're the, 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 the doing experimentation in the country, but it has already been done in uh, Norway. Okay, it is there. And you can imagine if your device is able to capture all this CO2, combine it with soil and put it underground, is, we call it mineralization. If you are, you are a student of the geology or geography, you have a better understanding. You can also capture carbon dioxide and fuse it with concrete. We have a client, we are, we are, we are doing these things. Some of the projects are very complicated. You, you, you must make sure your team has got science, science background. So even if you don't have a science background and you don't have the project, don't worry. You go to a couple of developers, they have a team which they can help you through this process. But I'm just telling you, there's a lot of opportunity. If you go to energy efficiency, remember the issue of uh, coal, coal plants switching, that's one of the projects. And also we have got energy efficiency. I know DevKey, if you ever listen to, and you can maybe Google this in YouTube, the time the owner of DevKey was having a session with the Jeff Koenig on JKL, and he mentioned the way in which whenever they're meeting the CO2, it's pushed back towards the production of steam, which is a generation of energy, and it's used to man in the manufacturing process. I think you just Google it and listen to the whatever. So these are some of the examples you can do in terms of energy efficiency. Waste disposal, in fact, this is very, very good. Very good because if you have a place like Dandora and you have a landfill, where there's a, there's a production of a lot of these gases like methane, they can go towards power generation. One, you're going to be doing waste recycling and then do power generation. Another example is, you have got something we call plastic credits. So if your company is dealing with the, 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 the collection and recycling of plastics, you can get plastic credits, which work more or less the same way as carbon credits. All these are, are tools. And I think by now you're seeing where the money is. Eh? I'm sure most of you now you're seeing a lot of money all over the place. But don't worry, we shall, we shall, we, we, are, we are still together. We're still together. And if I've got questions, just put them in the box or write them somewhere. In agriculture, I've been talking about livestock methane. I can also give an example of grassland. For example, if you have at least an acre of land, you can do what you call the soil organic carbon program, whereby we assess the quantity of or the ability of your soil and grass to sequester carbon dioxide. Why am I saying soil? Because it's what we call above ground and below ground. So the grass is above ground, the, the roots will be below ground. And also we can do something to the soil to make it more, more nutritious and improve its ability to sequester carbon. Those of you who are in agribusiness, I'm sure you know about organic fertilizers, vermiculture, vermicomposting. And if you don't know, 
and you have an acre of uh, farmland, you are sitting on money. We can talk more about this later, but I'm just giving you examples of how we can do the different projects in the different areas. Public transportation, if you're in Nairobi, we have most likely have used Basigo. These buses in Nairobi, I think along thicker, thicker, thicker highway, they're on electric. That's another example. Forestry, I don't think I can, I, I need to talk about it, but it's the most obvious one. You can have blue carbon, blue carbon coming from mangroves. We have something we're doing in Kilifi. Uh, we're still in development. You can do a forestation, you can do improved forest management. If you have ever heard of a company called Comaza, they do what called commercial forestry. They talk to farmers, they plant the trees, the, the land is owned by the farmers, then the, the trees will be taken down for commercial purposes, especially bamboo. It's called IFM. What we are saying, we're improving the management of forests. We're not just doing endless cutting. And on that note, and to conclude on this particular slide, I know most of you have been wondering why did the government lift the ban on logging. What is the logic? I don't want to get political, but I, I can tell you the science. Pine, cypress, and blue gum, Zikifika 25 or 30 years past post, uh, post maturity, they begin to dry up. And if they're not taken down and, and there's intensive, they can easily catch fire. An example is places like uh, places like uh, Canada. You hear this random forest fire is because of the scenarios. So there is some science to inform the policy. I don't want to get any question about that. That can get political, but I'm just giving you some of this basic science. And you can, of course, reach out to somebody in forestry and as a colleague, or you can reach out to me personally, but not on the platform. That said, I think I'm in the end of section two. Okay, let me just go quickly about the challenges. There are, there are a number of challenges, and one of them, for example, I mentioned is the issue of double counting, where Charles has a forest program, and I'll see a BMW credits Flani, the same same batch he's selling to another program. I will tell you some of the things which have been put in the, in the industry and how you can use what you call blockchain to, to stop that, like what we are doing. I know in some blockchain, we will figure out Bitcoin. No, blockchain is not a Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a simple thing. There's a lot more within blockchain. We'll talk about it later. But just have a, a, a screenshot of this. It gives you the different kinds of challenges and what can be done, et cetera, et cetera. And we can always talk about this. And, the, and I won't want to go to, to each one of them. But one of the biggest challenges, especially in Africa, I can tell you for free, is cash for project development. This project costs a lot. For you to be able to do a baseline study, you must bring a scientific team to do it. Lab tests for, like, in the case of soil, this is money. This is money. And then the, by, by now, I think you know it's a business what you can do. Just take a screenshot of this. I don't want to get into the particulars. Yeah, I, I, will, I will share my contacts, my email, my Twitter, my, my whatever. Don't worry. I'm still around. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there is uh, the rules of business. Just take a screenshot. I won't go into this, but I think by now you, you know what your business can do. And also there's the role of governments. And of course, governments is, is a key player because of regulation, et cetera, et cetera, public education. I really wish that the ministry can put some, some of these teachings or lessons within the CBC from an early age. So as we are growing up from kindergarten to college level, one, we are environmentally aware, and two, those who are into STEM, science, uh, technology, and mathematics can look at some of the ways in which you can come up with technology to combat climate. Yeah, so there's a lot the government can also do. And that is the end of session two. The last session will be session three. I'll open the mics for five minutes, come up on a swally, specifically on what we have been talking about. And please avoid the issue of why we are cutting down trees through the government directly. Avoid those political questions. I cannot answer them. You can answer them in person or explain in person. But do you have a question to what I've covered so far? Maybe one or two questions, chap chap. I have one. Yeah. Can you elaborate yeah. on, on the, on the... I, I, Again, the, the, somebody who has commented on the issue of logging, as I said, I was giving the, the science behind it. I'm not saying I'm for the idea because the, the main forest programs that we, I, I like doing is afforestation, deforestation, red plus. I don't like doing IFM because IFM is very commercial and it has a lot of uh, controversies, especially the, the voluntary carbon registries don't, they don't like them, but but I hope I hope that is clear. Yes, go ahead with your question. Yeah, I needed uh, clarity on uh, something I've talked about uh, 
uh, carbon credit on having a, about an acre. My network was bad, so I would kind of request you to go again, give it a go again. Come again, a network of? I was saying, uh, how can one can make a, can make a carbon project uh, using lard? You say something one acre of lard you, from you calculate from the soil and also from yes, the... okay. Uh, I I I'll just reiterate. Th there's something it's called it's on uh, in the in the realms of organic fertilizers. It's uh, it's called vermiculture and vermicomposting. It's basically you use some of the farm or the kitchen waste, like vegetables, like uh, vegetables, the cow dung, of course, when the cow dung is warm, and then you feed this to atoms. Yes, atoms. Now, as the atoms is consuming, and but the atoms eat a lot. Eh? <laughs> when the atom is consuming these things, this agricultural waste and kitchen waste and uh, and whatever waste, this organic waste, and it, it eats this food, quote unquote, and then it excretes. It excretes matter. And also liquids, which is like uh, humus, humus of sorts. Then you take it and you can put it to your land if you're a farmer, or you can sell it if you want to do the business of army composting, organic fertilizer. In Kenya, we import about 22,000 tons of uh, inorganic fertilizer. And if you're a farmer, you know very well it kills the soil over time. So we, should, we, we can do organic. And if you decide to do it organic and you've got, you got cattle, and you've got also normal farming, think of this from a circular economy perspective, whereby you are feeding cattle with, uh, with, with, with grass coming from a grassland where you can do a, a soil organic carbon project. And at the same time, you're also, reduce, you're also making sure your, your, your cattle is eating a, nutri a nutrified grass which can reduce its emeth methane emission. It might sound easy, but there's a bit of science, but basically that's how you can do the the whole idea of uh, what do you call this? Of vermiculture, vermicomposting, soil organic carbon, methane. Or if you're just doing agriculture, fine. You can just forget about the livestock and just focus on the soil organic carbon on the grasslands. Yeah. I, I, I've edited. So I, I hope I've answered you. Yeah. I've edited my I've edited my my name. Like I put in my email and phone number. So if I've got more technical questions. We can always have this, those chats via email, especially if you have a project man. I like them bring an email. It's more easy for me to understand. Is there any other question before we proceed? Yes, I have one. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, does Kenyan government engage in carbon credits with its citizens? And if yes, how can um, like um, maybe grassroots organizations um, gain from these uh, voluntary credits? Uh -huh. Okay, that is a tricky because the, the, the government projects which I know are within the, the realms of carbon, uh, carbon development. Okay, remember, okay, let me put it this way. When, when a, 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 an entity like government, when it's doing an, a development project, they don't have carbon in mind, like Kenji, for example. The carbon becomes an alternative stream because for it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative stream because the main idea was to have more electricity for the people of Kenya in a very cost efficient way. And this is not very cost efficient. So later on, it's uh, somebody there who suggested that, hey, Kenyan can also be getting what you call the renewable energy certificates, the credits. So that then became the, the, the program it was doing. In terms of government financing local CBOs to do carbon project, I will say it is there. It is in practice, and most of you, maybe the last month or the last two months, you had something about the elections, uh, world co climate committees. Amma, you've had something called FLOCA, financing, yes. financing locally led uh, climate uh, programs, yeah? activities, FLOCA. That is where you get your money from the government. If you want money, the government supports your carbon projects or climate projects, that's where you can get through FLOCA at the county level. But, but in terms of the individuals selling the credit to government, no, no. Again, also, there's a technicality when you generate credits from the voluntary carbon market and want to sell to the carbon to the compliance market. COP27, the Article 6 provides a provision for that, but they have not finalized how the framework will look like. Because if Charles is going to do a first program 
and wants to claim to sell the credits to the government of Kenya, we have to make sure that the Charles will not sell the credits from his forest program to another voluntary buyer like BMW, double counting. So that those, those uh, governance questions that have to be ironed up, but technically it should be possible, but the legal framework has not yet been finalized. I, I hope I have, I have answered that question. There's a question from- That David. is very clear, Charles, thank you. Okay, Karibu. There's a question from David. Do you have any projects in West Africa, especially in Mechanics Sierra Leone? How can community-based organization with the capital incentive? We can assist, okay, I'll, I'll come and talk about what our company does and how we can help, because we want to focus on African projects, particularly on one project development and pre-financing, but of course, we have to do a feasibility assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, that one we can do. In terms of modules, in terms of the question, uh, second question is, what can you do to learn about the carbon markets? I will tell you for free, and I don't want to disparage any university. Most of the current uh, practitioners in the market, especially the, the developers or the third party verification agencies, the auditors, you will find them, they have got a baseline degree, a degree, like, let's say in, in the engineering, environmental science, or energy, whatever it is, a baseline degree. And then you do certification courses. There's one, there's one university called, or another institute is called GHG Institute, where you can do these small, small courses to build your capacity. But in terms of a degree, specifically tailored towards carbon market development, I, I am not familiar. If it's there, I don't know. But I, 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 the, be, the best approach would be if you love doing projects in renewable energy, so you do an energy related degree, and then you do these small, small courses from places like GHG to build your, your understanding on how do you do the calculation, how do you do the measurement, reporting, verification, those small modules. And once we go through this, the cycle of the carbon project in, in section three, you will see how exactly the, the, the market is very broad and how you can build your, 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 your CV in terms of how you can become an auditor or how you can become a project developer. Yeah, that, that's the, the simple answer. If let's say the example I gave on direct air capture, on carbon capture and storing in the ground. So if you're a person with a geology background, then, we, you just boost your, your, your understanding on how to do the calculations, then you should be good to do diet air capture project developments. Yeah, so it, it's a question of mixing some bit of uh, basic education, a diploma or degree, and then you add the small, small courses to, to refine your knowledge. Yeah, because as of now, I, I, I don't know if there's an university in the country, specifically, I don't know, it could be, but I, I don't know for sure. Okay, if there's no other question, allow me to proceed to section three. And, and, and uh, this is now where, if you are interested in doing a carbon project, you need to understand, and I want to make this very clear. I want to make this very, very clear. This is not something you talk to me or, or, or our company tomorrow on Monday, and then in two, three months, you're expecting carbon credits. No, no. This is what, what and, and forgive me for using this analogy, it's, it's, it's a long-term marriage, but limited. It's, it's, it's going to be very long, you have to be very committed, but it has a lifespan. I mentioned on lifespan. That's what I'm saying, it's, it's long-term, but it also has its limitation and endpoint. And, and I'll tell you now before I start, and you'll see why I'm, I'm quoting this years. Once I show you the, the I come to this, so it's, and, and I'll explain to you why I, I'm going to quote this years. If you can see your screen, you're seeing a cycle from number one to number nine. For you to move from number one, feasibility, and you get to PDB, it will take you, it will take about three, three to six months depending on who you're engaging and how, and the kind of projects. Because like any project, if you're doing a feasibility and they're telling me you have a hundred acres and you want to do forests, you want to do whatever it is, we have to make sure. Remember, I talked about the issue of, uh, of transparency, additionality, and permanent, and I'll talk about what, what they mean. So it takes a bit of time to move from one stage to the next. So the minimum, the bare minimum you can start to get in these things is one year. Not unless 
you do what you say, what, what I mentioned earlier about the Ford purchase. That is, you sell your credits in advance in bulk to a particular investor. But if you want to develop the project and then sequester carbon and then sell the credits, it can take you up to even three years. And once I explain this cycle from number one, stage one to stage nine, you'll understand why I'm quoting this year. So if somebody will tell you they are going to give you the credits in, in two months, three months, most likely they're talking about forward purchases. And I know that some entities have been going around in the community saying, oh, plant trees, and then every year I'll be paying you some, this, uh, every month I'll be paying you cash shillings this for every tree. Those ones are most likely they did a forward purchase or something, or I don't know why they're doing it, but if you're doing it from scratch, it will take you a bit of time. But I can assure you, once, you come to stage number six, you have started in the implementation. After the first after the first time you have got the first issuance, stage number eight, the remaining years is going to be a matter of you just maintaining your trees, doing uh, verification and waiting for cash. So the first three to five years will be very tough because you're trying to make sure things are in order, but from year four to year 20, you're going to have a less, Let's, uh, what's, what's the one? You're going to have an easier time because the project is now already running. So think of it like a child, it's born. So the first two, three years is the hustle of feeding, walking, talking. But once the kid is uh, a teenager, now they're becoming more of an adult and now they can run things on their own. So that's the same thing with the carbon project. At the beginning, there'll be challenges. You have to overcome. So you have to make sure you have the right partners on board. But once things are moving, things become easy. So before I get to that, let me start from the very top on this principle. And I, I, and I like to start with the, the principles of the VCM, the vol voluntary carbon markets, on what you need to do to make sure we have what you call the quality of quality credits, because the higher the quality of your credits, the more money somebody will be willing to give you. So if you can make sure your project development document, the proposal, has been able to clearly articulate these five key issues clearly with data, not stories, with data. I can tell you for free, you'll be selling your credit above the market rates because companies, especially genuine serious companies from abroad, that is, the, that is Europe and North America. Think of it like Microsoft, Apple. They are looking for premium credits. That is credits coming from projects which have covered these five things very well. So I'll take two minutes to explain what these are. But remember, my, my, but remember, any project developer you, you come across and is avoiding these things is going to mess you up. So what is additionality? Now, I, this is the, the definition of additionality is, 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 is it's like a tongue twister. So it goes like this. Will that which you're trying to do happen without your intervention or that which you're trying to do won't have happened without you doing it? For example, in Kenya, we have Abadea forests. Then the question is this, and I'm able to, to quickly answer it. Let me open the mic. Can you get carbon credits from a forest like Abadea, for example? If your answer is yes, tell me why. If your answer is no, tell me why. Somebody quick to the microphone, one person. There's no right or wrong answer. We're all learning here. We're all learning here. Anyone, anyone? Um, I yeah, can, no. I, can I give it a try? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I will say no because uh, Abadea Forest is a government uh, forest, and uh, of course, uh, it's it, it somehow also a government protected area, and there is no way you can just move in and say it is your project. That is my thinking. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Somebody else? We are all learning here. I, I just um, want to show you some of the facts on the ground. Uh, go ahead. Um, I will say uh, the only way that I see fit will be if you're doing a project within the Abadea Forest that you own individually, 
then that will be possible but uh, but about yeah for us being as it as it is going for double credits i don't think it will be possible and let's mm-hmm. the community okay thank you maybe one more person i, uh, maybe I, I can say, say i think <laughs> Yes, the, the lady. Let's have some gender. Yes, yeah, I think if we are not looking at the ownership aspect, I think uh, Abadia Forest can still uh, have uh, carbon credits because already as it exists, it's able to capture carbon. So if we are not looking at ownership, then I think it's capable of earning credits. That's okay. my opinion. Thank you. Now, let me put up to the question. Assuming there is no issue of ownership in terms of who owns the forest, whether it's government or community or a broker or whoever it is, can we talk about monetizing Abadea forest in terms of carbon credits? If yes, why? If no, why? And I want you to uh, look at the definition. I want you to look at the definition of additionality. Then give me the answer. for me. Mm-hmm. The answer is no, uh, mm-hmm. because when you're looking at a carbon credits project based on your earlier uh, definitions, it either has to be a, a project that is reducing uh, uh, the level of carbon, or it's uh, it, it was either reducing or preventing further emissions. Yeah, or I removing. Yeah, removing. I, I, yeah, or removing. Please remove carbon. Yes, but uh, they are already in existence, and uh, so you're looking at uh, trying to remove the carbon that is already within the environment. So the mm-hmm. trees are already doing it; they are already in existence. So for us mm-hmm. to increase, reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, then we need to plant more trees. And planting more trees is what would be a carbon credits project rather than an existing forest. That's how I see it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Somebody else? Well, I want yeah. to, to, I, I, and when somebody is speaking, I, I really want you to listen to, to the explanation because I want us to learn some of the principles, especially on additionality. And I want to reiterate. Yes. Basically, additionality is, are you doing something different from whatever is already in existence? Next person, yeah. yes. Can I can I I would say yes, you can earn carbon, you can earn carbon credits from Abadea Forest uh-huh. because you can improve the management mm-hmm. and the forest ecosystem. The other ones you can enhance the forests and you can earn carbon credits from it. Thank you. Thank you. One last can question. I make a point? Yes, can I make last question? Yes, yes. Um, I would say that I think when you're looking at carbon credits, you've got to look at, for instance, um, human activity, human encroachment. If the forest was going to go because populations were increasing and a forest was going to get destroyed, if you can start a program where you can prove that that forest was going to be destroyed, but now you're protecting it, then I think uh, you would be able to um, qualify for carbon credits. Thank you. Now, if I, if I told you interestingly, all of you are correct. And this is why. In the case of forests, there are different kinds of forests. Like I think the second speaker give, gave a very good classification. Number one, remember the, in the beginning I told you, with forestry, you can talk about afforestation, reforestation, and revegetation, ARR. That's one classification of a forest. Afforestation, reforestation, vegetation. To me, you then ask yourself, how, how is Abadea Forest right now? Have, has Abadea Forest been facing a case of illegal logging, poor cutting? Has, has the soil in Abadea Forest been deteriorating? And now you claim you want to reverse the change. Another classification of forest is what we call improved forest management, whereby if, if, if uh, part of the community was living in there, then you, you, you're coming up with a solution whereby you can have that forestry, for example, but also make sure the forest is growing and whoever is living in the forest, the indigenous community living in the forest are still maintaining it. And then lastly, it's called a C, avoided conversion. For example, the controversy in the, in the current conversation right now, a forest which has always been okay, living peacefully by itself, 
But now we have been hearing Chemi Chemi that so and so <coughs> wants to come in and cut down the trees for logging. So you are then saying you're going to avoid conversion. If you're going to be fitting these three categories in Abadea Forest and you prove through data that Abadea Forest was going to be targeted for conversion to logging or Abadea Forest was being targeted for, uh, was being deforested and you want to reforestate it, then that becomes additional and the government or a community living within the forest with authority from the government can claim and develop a carbon project. But those conditions have to be there. But if you take a forest that does not have any of these problems, it has been there since the beginning of Africa as a continent, and it has not been logged, it has not been done anything bad, then you cannot do a carbon project there because you are not doing anything of value. You're not adding any value. You're not doing anything additional. There's nothing new you're doing, and the forest has been okay as it is, and so it does not need any further intervention from you. I hope I'm very clear on that. So whereas you might look at everything as a carbon angle, you must support the, the point on additionality. Okay? I'll give the example of mangrove forest. Why we have mangrove carbon projects in, in, in the country down there in the coast is because between the 90s and up to around 2010, we, we lost quite a huge portion of our mangrove forest cover because the communities down there, they use mangroves because apparently mangrove is good for funding some small furniture making uh, and firewood. So, and that's why you find even the, the, the AFS and KWS are down there literally guarding the mangroves with watchtowers and whatever because of people used to do a lot of firewood, whatever. So the projects that are there like in Mikupamoji and Kwale, what they're doing is one, the areas of mangrove which are deforested, they begin, they are, not, they are doing now the reforestation, about 100, 100 plus hectares. And then also they're having ecotourism to allow the communities who are living with close to the forest or close to the mangroves to not look at mangrove as just firewood, but to live off from let's say beekeeping and so forth. And because Mikupamoja was able to demonstrate that, 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 that the Gazi mangrove forest was coming to a, to a was undergoing a slow death, they were able to prove that whatever they're going to do was going to be additional and hence it was certified in terms of additionality and hence it's a carbon project. They get what you call blue carbon. And it's one of the premium carbon projects in the world in terms of carbon credits. So additionality is you must show the difference and you must say that if I don't do the carbon credits angle, then nobody will, will, will change. Let me give the example of cook stoves. I've given you the example of how an electric cooker can, an electric cook stove can be. It can be as high as 15,000. So if I don't have carbon credits that are going to subsidize the cost of this electric cook stove, then Charles, Kimani, Wanjiku, and Omondi, and all other Kenyans and Africans are not going to buy this electric cook stove because it's too expensive. So it becomes additional because without carbon credits subsidizing the cost of production, it will be unaffordable and Charles et al. will keep on using firewood. Is my point on additionality very clear? Yes, it's it very is, clear. Yes. Very clear, so, value addition, value addition. Thank Good. you. Yes. Ah, yeah. Next, the next principle, I, I, and before I move on, I, I, and before I move on, whenever you're, you're looking at, you know, the, the 170 different types of projects, so each one of them, there's a specific methodology that you can use. And please remind me before we close, I can show you an example of a methodology. And then in that methodology, it will be showing you the different uh, points of additionality you have to prove. There's like a checklist. Is your project this? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And if all becomes thick, then you can proceed. If not, stop. So and a, a typical methodology can be as long as 50 or 60 pages. It's very scientific. And if you don't follow it, you're done. You do whatever you're doing like any, who you have just done it from Mother Nature, but not for carbon credits. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a, we, are a very, in a, we are in a very highly regulated and strict environment because we don't want funny, funny stories of, of carbon credits. Verification. Remember, let's say, uh, let's say Paul, 
all came to Bus Carbon to do a, a, a forest program. So Bus Carbon is a project developer. They are now developing the carbon projects. And at the end of the, after two years, it does a monitoring, reporting, and verification report. Uh, that's, it then wants to share it to, let's say, Plan Vivo or Vera, so as they can view it and issue credits. However, a third party has to look at the reports coming out from the project developer, whether it's Vascarbon, whether it's Southpole, whoever it is. Third party verification must be done on the MRV reports. So what happens with the third party verification is somebody will come from a company authorized by the registry like Vera, and they're going to come and see, okay, they say they've been able to capture this amount of carbon. Is it true? They do their own analysis. I want to think of it like a, an auditor. Even if KCB does a financial statement, they must go to maybe PwC or KPMG to do the financial auditing. And they say, okay, the report issued by KPMG is good, and this is a certification. Now you can proceed. So similarly, within the carbon markets, we must have third party verification. Whether you want it or not, it has to be verified. And if it's verified and given a clean bill of health, it's then taken to the registry and then you're issued. Because you're involving a third party, who most likely is not from your country, because there are barely 25 companies globally that who are uh, what you call accredited third party verifiers, there are very few. So bringing them down to here, the global health is very expensive. I will not say how much, but they're, 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 they're a bit costly. And that's why I said in the beginning, doing a carbon project development can be very expensive. It's, it's out of reach from small and medium owners or farmers or, or, or whatever. And that's why our company, we, we come in, there's something we do. I'll tell you about but, but how we can try and see how can we pull together, how can we aggregate different uh, carbon owners or forest owners to bring down the cost of verification. Okay, so verification is very important. You, you just don't wake up and tell me, oh, my forest has captured a million carbon credits. No, 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 no. There's a formula that steps towards this calculation. Permanence. You cannot plant eucalyptus tree or any tree and say these trees in these two acres are for carbon credits. And then in between, you're cutting branches, you're cutting one, two, two, three trees to build your house or to do fire. No. Permanence. What you do must stay there even after you depart, like when you leave, you, you die literally. Permanence. And part of the methodology has got specific metrics that are used to assess whether or not there's going to be permanence. Okay? So once you capture the carbon dioxide, you must make sure it cannot go. Because when you burn the tree, or you chop on the tree, then whatever carbon you had you had sequestered is literally going to be reversed. Now, this registry is the, the, the way in which they they also secure themselves from our project. So whenever doing a project in the beginning, 15% or about 10, 10 to 15%, depending on which, which registry, it is whether it's from Vivo, Gold Standard, or Vera, they say 10 to 15% of whatever credits you're going to get will be put in a buffer pool. So in case there's going to be a leakage or lack of permanence, it can be used to recorrect that issue. But these are technical details you, you get them when you're doing with a project developer. Then measurability. Any carbon project involves serious science and mathematics. For those of you who remember the statistics back in high school, calculus, numbers are things to do with summation. I know you ran away from them, but if you want to come to the carbon markets, <laughs> they're back, but don't worry. So long as we have got a project developer, you can always get the assistance to do the, the measurements. And then, then lastly is avoiding leakage. So I've given you the example of a, of a leakage. Another example of a leakage, for example, will be, think of it, let's say, we have given Charles an electric cook stove to use, but uh, he may not have money to buy tokens. So he says, ah, for the next one week until I get my salary, let me get, let me use some charcoal. So these are things which are anticipated and they're not the fault of the project developer. So what then happens is within the formula, and I'll, I'll just show you what the formula is. Within the formula, there is a minus leakage emissions. There's a way in which we calculate potential leakages. So it's usually we say, in most cases we say, whatever we are going to get from your emissions, we then multiply by 0 
So as we're saying 10% of whatever you're saying you captured might have been a leakage. So to Matoa, you remove that. There's a, there's a very specific formula. I won't want to get into it maybe for, my, for another day, but yeah, there's a way in which the formulas, the, the methodologies, they account for leakages for each of the different kinds of projects. Remember I've said, if you make sure your project covers all those principles, you are improving the value of your credits. But if you really want to make sure that your credits are top dollar, that will make Bill Gates get on his knees and ask you to sell it to him, look at what you call co-benefits. And I want to explain co-benefits using the example of Miko Kopamoje because it's something which has been doing very well for the last 10 plus years. And I really personally like it, I admire it because it has improved the community. The carbon credits has been able to dig boreholes, build schools, have clinics, and several other things. Co-benefits are basically, think of them like in the form of the SDGs. Does your project show potential to improve the health of the community, reduce poverty, improve water and sanitation? For example, reduce inequalities. How reduce inequalities? It's empowering women and making sure women and men economically they are, they are, they are, they are, they are at par. Okay, so if, if your project is able to capture all these other impacts, then I'm telling you. Yeah, so they were stupid. Exactly, like my father is stupid for working hard. And that's Well, I'm sorry, I'm out of mute that guy. I forgot to mute the max for everyone. But basically, if you're doing a community based project, when I say community based, I mean a project that cuts across a community and it's able to show all these things. Because now you can imagine if you're doing an electric project, if you're able to do an electric cookstove project, we are then saying, show, show uh, grandmother, my grandmother will not die from, from the, the greenhouse gases of using charcoal and firewood. Her health is going to become better because She's no longer being exposed. So we show over time, over the last one year, this community of Kiambu that have been using cook stove as opposed to, let's say, firewood, have there been a reduction of people going to the hospital because of ammonia and other respiratory diseases? If the answer is yes, then you have shown that this program has indeed some form of co-benefits in the form of health. Has some of the money been used to improve or pay for bursaries of the people? Yes, quality education or improved education, good health and so forth and so forth. Because most of these foreigners, as you know this, eh? at least I think you all know this, they like to see impact. They want to see transparency and they want to see impact. So if you show, show transparency in terms of the principles of quality and they show impact in terms of the co-benefits, I am telling you where your typical forest credits will have been going for $6, uh, one credit, it can go up to maybe 20 or 15 to 20 dollars per carbon credit. Show the impact, explain the, to the potential buyer, and you get more money for because you're telling them you are not just buying the credits, you are buying school fees for somebody, you, you are paying for somebody's NHIF, you are digging a borehole, and so forth and so forth. So try and show these things, especially when you're doing a project that's going to impact involve the community as end users or whatever. Before I pro pro proceed, if there's no question, or if there's a question, let me know, just one question, then I can proceed to, I can proceed to the project cycle. Yeah, I've already talked about the third party verification. Before I proceed to carbon project cycle, just one question, or we're all together. Good, okay. So let me mute everyone. A project cycle has different stages. And really I want you to, to, to view, to view um, a project cycle like any other project, but of course this is more unique, but the steps are more or less similar. For those of you who have done projects, and for those of you who have done maybe a, a master's thesis or something of the sort, you always know 
that the first thing you must do is feasibility study. I, is your projects bankable? If you want an investor to come and invest in your project, it must be what you call bankable. And the bankability comes from feasibility. If you're doing a livestock with them project, then it simply means the more the cattle, the better it is because you're able to capture more carbon projects. I'll be very honest with you. If you have one or two cattle, you cannot do a carbon project on your own. It's just for two kettles. What a company like us, Carbon will then do is, we'll come to a county, let's say the county of Kiambu, uh, an area maybe within, this, within a, an area of uh, 100 hectares, there are 100 or 200 farmers who have got X number of kettle each. Then we aggregate and group you together as the Kiambu Dairy Livestock Project. Because we are looking at reducing the economies of scale. Then it becomes bankable. But I cannot do just for you. You're telling me, okay, you, I've got two kettle, do I'm saying, no, it, it's the cost implication is just crazy. Okay, because you have to do the measurement of the baseline scenario, the third party people, and even the registries that put their own small fee there. Okay, so we tend to do what you call the aggregation. We group people together, especially what you call the, the small small holders. I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but that's the fact. Eh? It's not easy to find the people having 10,000 hectares by themselves. They are there, but in fewer numbers. The case of Kenya, you'll find farmers having one acre, two acre, three acres, maybe five kettles, you know, something small. Even when it comes to forest, the minimum will be 0 0.5, but I cannot just do for one person 0 0.5 acres for forest, no. What I'll say is, okay, there is a pole here, 0 0.5. There's Jen there, another maybe one acre. Somebody else is there in the same county with this acre, this acre, this acre. Then we do what you call aggregation, and then we group you together. In terms of how then does everyone get their share, it's based on proportionality. If you are forest is 0 0.5 acres, and the easy is two acres, then of course, proportional, proportionally speaking, the one with the two acres will be most likely be getting more than you. But of course, all those nitty gritties are things then we resolve them and do the feasibility assessment. That's the first stage. And of course, the feasibility assessment will be preceded or it must kick off with the concepts. What is the idea? So like right now I'm speaking to you, I hope by now you guys are getting ideas. You are thinking of, of the, uh, the, the assets you have, the ideas you have. I know some of you maybe are a student at JQART or whatever, they've got some ideas on, uh, on uh, renewable energy, cook stove, these ideas are there. So come up with the concept note, and if you have assistance, you can always reach out. Then we come to the feasibility assessment. In most cases, us as a company, we are willing to finance the feasibility assessment, assessment but of course, there are those, be those the discussions we can have. Then once we have the feasibility assessment, we'll be able to know, okay, for us to develop this project, we will need X amount of dollars, X amount of shillings, X amount of francs, whatever it is. So we then design, we, we, we do the project design and the financing concept. So as we see, are we self-financing? Do you have the ability to finance yourself? Do you have the ability to finance your 10,000 acres of forest? If not, can we do what you call pre-financing? So pre-financing is whereby, you are looking for people who want to finance your projects and they can do it in different ways. I'll, I'll be very quick because it's something we, we, I, I won't cover it again in carbon financing, but uh, when it comes to pre-financing in carbon projects, an investor might want to give you a grant. Okay, somebody like a USA will say, okay, no, just have this $1,000 as a grant. You just do what you're doing, then that's pay me back. Somebody else can give you in the form of a bank or of a loan. Most likely, especially if you're looking at a, institutional investors or retail investors, they might say, okay, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but it's a loan, you're going to pay me in X number of years, blah, blah, blah. Another option is somebody say, okay, look, I'm going to give you a million shillings, but don't pay me back in, in currency, pay me back in terms of credits. So I give you a million dollars, you pay me back in terms of credits worth a million dollars. And of course, we'll discuss the price with, with the client before that. The last option is what, what we call, uh, equity. 
So somebody say, okay, okay, so your project is worth $20 million. So if I give you $5 million, can I have, um, what's that? 25% share of your project. So the different ways you people do pre-financing, and of course, you must make sure you have the right people, the right project developers to help you in those conversations. Yeah? Yeah, because whereas you are thinking of, of uh, Mother Nature, others are thinking of, of, of fattening their wallets. So you must make sure you have people whom you trust, whom you know, they are looking after your interests. And of course, there's a whole matter of legal document, contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Then once you have, you have done your feasibility and you have got your pre-financing about some bit of money, then you prepare what you call the project design document, PDD. Project design document. I want you, and I'm sorry for this example, but I want you to think of the PDD like your holy book. It is the alpha, it is, it is, it is where the A to Z of your project is going to be written. It will indicate the location, it will indicate the, the size, the scope, the everything of your project. And when you're developing a PDD, and maybe in another session, I can show you examples because I know because of time, most of you are getting tired. Uh, I can even show you example, or even in the, in the, the link of, the, of this document, I can throw in an example of a PDD. The PDD will even show how has your project applied the methodology from, let's say, Vera or from, let's say, Plan Vivo. It will clearly indicate the step by step process you used in applying the methodology. Remember, I've told you. It's not just about digging a hole, putting a sibling and, and waiting for a credit. No, there's some science behind it. So that's science, the mathematics, the issue of co-benefits, the issue of the principles I mentioned earlier, all of that will and should be captured in the PDD. Once you have your PDD, you then have a third party auditor to come and do what you call validation. VVB means Validation, verification, but you remember the third party agencies are talking about? This is where they come in. They are coming to validate whether whatever you have put in your PDD is in line with the methodology from, let's say, one of the registries. If it's Vera, if it's Plandivo or Gold Standard. If your project design document is aligned to the methodology, then they will give you a green light and you can proceed to file, stock, register your project with one of these standards, either Vera, Plan Vivo, and uh, the other one. You can then register. Once you have registered, <clears throat> once you have registered, and the and the registry has accepted, I said yes, your PDD is in order. Please proceed. Then you can begin doing what you call project implementation. So if you are doing a mangrove restoration program it then means you can now go ahead, do the, the mangrove restoration, and immediately you, start, <clears throat> immediately you start implementation, you must start monitoring the data. And monitoring must occur for at least 12 months. You must do a full year of monitoring, of project implementation and monitoring. Now, sorry. This is where it gets interesting. For you to now, after monitoring your data and want to get credits, we, somebody, a third party, has to come and verify that whatever you are implementing was what was initially validated and approved by the registry. So they have to verify. Don't confuse validation and verification. Validation is to see is the PDB in line with the methodology from the registry? Verification is when you have done your project implementation, we are verifying the data you are, you are, the, you are collecting. We are verifying whether you stuck to what you are told to do. And if the VB finds that you, you, you stuck to the protocols given, it then communicates to the registry and tells them, Chances for rest, after one year, they're able to collect data and we have verified that the data collected speaks towards them having captured X amount of carbon dioxide and hence, please, provide, please proceed and issue them with X carbon credits. So the question is, 
this carbon credits, what it looks like, it's basically a certificate that says, it's just like you're graduating, so and so studied here, four years, blah, blah, and they're graduated. So similar with the carbon credits, the certificates issued by the registry. And for information, your PDD, your carbon credits will be a publicly available information. Right now, I can log in into the website for Vera and show you a project. In fact, you know what? To make this very practical, so as it does not look like I'm dealing with astrophysics, let me right now log into one registry. I'm oh, not sharing. Let me, let me share my screen. Let me share my screen. Just bear with me. We, we are almost at the end. I just, we, 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 we'll be done in about 20 minutes. Can you see what I'm sharing? Okay, your screen is loading. Can you see the screen? If, if somebody is seeing the screen, just tell me you can see it. Or... I can see the screen. Yeah, so this is the Vera registry. So right now, if I want to know all the projects, voluntary carbon projects done in the Republic of Kenya through Vera, I come here, I click there, projects, it's loading, it's loading, uh -huh. it's loading, be patient, it's loading. So if you come to Vera Registry to show you the number of things they've done. So I just come here and search country. I want to go to, let's say, Kenya. For those who are from elsewhere, I'm, I'm, I'm just using Kenya as an example. If you are from Sierra Leone, I think I'm from Sierra Leone, we can also do it right now and see. So here I can search by methodology. I can search by project type. I can search by country, by status, by whatever. But I'm just showing you so. In the Republic of Kenya, there are, 40, there are only 43 voluntary carbon projects done with Vera. And these are the ones. Most I'm seeing there in energy, energy, the zone for waste, energy, energy industry. I hope you can all see my screen. There's agroforestry, Steve Paparico, there's Mitra here is doing something. Yeah, it's a very good company. There, there, there are several. There's Jigo Sasa, Jigo Koa, there's Coco, and so forth and so forth. So they're both 41 and there's Komaza there. Are we together? If you are seeing what I'm, I'm, I'm doing, there's Chulu Hills. I don't know, you pronounce it the Chulu my Chulu, whatever, but I hope you can see it. So there are about 43 vo voluntary carbon projects done by Vera in Kenya. We have somebody from Sierra Leone. Let's just show, let's just for, for his sake, let's see what's, what's been done in Sierra Leone. This is just for demonstrative purposes. And then I, 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 I will show you the PDD for any project. Okay. Hey. Sierra Leone, it's loading. I want to show you guys that the, the carbon credits is not, we're not selling air, we're actually doing projects. So in Sierra Leone, there are three projects. There's Gola, there's uh, something in uh, that one, and then there's the Agua. So if I go to, to Gola, Gola Red Plus project, I hope you're seeing now the screenshot Gola. I should be able to come and download the project design documents because all this information, all this information has to be put on public so it can be scrutinized. Because the last thing we want is you to do a forest program on a land which is not yours. So usually when you file your PDD with the registry, the registry will open what you call global consultation for 30 days, where anybody and everybody who's interested can do comments. So in case you're doing a project where it has been banned or it's not yours or you're hijacking or something, there can be a comment and now the registry will verify and make sure, okay, are these comments being made genuine, valid or whatever? So if I come here, uh, I, I, it's for the description, I click there. It's going to download this document. Oh, you can just download the document. I'm opening the document. Let me share my screen. Okay, now let, let me share you the screen from, I will share you the screen of the project design document from Gola in Sierra Leone. It's uh, sharing, it, my screen is loading, patience. Yes. Can you see this? If you can see this, please let me know you're seeing this. Somebody? We can see it, we can see it. Thank you. So this is the GOLA Red Plus project design document. 
You can see it's 28, one, 128 pages. As I said, eh, this thing is no joke. So the product design document will, will tell you who's developing it, when it starts, the crediting period, the scale, the location. Let me just skim down to it. Eh? I'm just going down for you to see. A, a carbon project is a, it's a good thing to do, but it's not a work in the park. So you must make sure you get your data right. I'm just skimming through. We get to see what, so I, I hope you can all see this table. So the Gola Red Plus project, it's saying in the year 2012, they are able to remove or reduce greenhouse emission amounting to 377,000 tons of CO2. Let me, let me just expand this. I hope it's now bigger. In 2012, 2013, 390,000. Yes, 2014, that amounts. So all these things have to be captured in the project design documents. And as you can see, this project is going to go for 10 years. And these people are saying, in 10 years, we shall be able to capture or reduce 4.9 million tons of greenhouse gases. And once you have this in a PDB, you can look for somebody who can come and buy all your credits in advance, either all of them or partially, because you did the science. Let me show you the calculations. So as you, when I tell you, you have to involve technicians or people with experience, or, or rather um, the technical know-how, and, and with my math, math and whatnot, you can see. So you, you even have to literally put a map to show you where exactly in Sierra Leone. You must put GPS and you must put the visual map. You can see this person is even indicating. I, I hope I, I don't want to scare anyone. I just want you guys to know. Yes, there's money out there, but there's a lot of work to do. And yeah, we can work this thing together and, and, and see where we can get. I, I want to come to the emissions reduction calculations. I'm just skimming through first because I know we are almost out of time. And maybe I can talk with Nina. We can uh, we, we can always have a, a session on something else. Yeah, all, all these things usually are captured in the methodology. Uh -huh. So you see this part, this table here. It's showing you the the land size and the amount of credit it's getting. Okay, that's why I said for, for me to even tell you a million acres, I, I need a lot of information, location, species, size, you know, there's a lot of information. In fact, this person has done the calculation up to the year 2041, meaning after the first 10 years, this project is going to be, to be renewed and renewed, okay? That's why I usually say, if you're looking at a carbon project, you're looking at 20, 30 years in totality before we can now say, okay, you have done as much as you could possibly and godly do. I want to go to the calculation. Mm -hmm. So within the methodology, there, there is what we call the quantification of GHG emission. So this is the thing that you can say, you can do a small mini course. So if you're into forest programs, you can do a small mini course. It can teach you this, or of course, you can get it through the consultation you have with your project developer. I hope you can see this formula. Don't worry what, how to go, but I'm just trying to show you that uh, there's a bit of science, the calculation that's involved, and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, as we say in Kenya, Chemi Chemi, it is, it is actual, actual science that we do. So once you're issued, okay, I've gone back to sharing, I'm not sharing the project cycle. Once you're issued, you're issued credits for the first batch, Uh, once once you have issued the, the first batch of credits, then you can, as you can see from number eight, the arrow is pointing back to six. So I'll give you the example of how I would advise you. If you are doing a forest program, I'll say, let's do the initial project implementation and monitoring for the first three years. Then after three years, we bring in the, 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 the person to do verification. Why? 
If you are going to be doing verification every single year, then you're going to be paying for verification every single year to this third party. This money is not coming to the developer, it's not coming to the registry, it's going to the third party agency. So I will recommend to the project owner, let's do implementation and monitoring for three years. So we mobilize a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. So as we call this, validate, this verifier to do verification once for three years, he verifies it, we get issued lump sum credits for these three years. After the first cycle of three years, we do it again for the next three years, three years, three years, three years, three years like that, until you are done. If it's for us program, you're done in the first 10 years, and then we renew for another 10 years. Again, we continue. So as you have this thing in bulk, and we reduce the cost of bringing in this verifier because they're, they're typically expensive. <coughs> they're typically expensive. And then, of course, once you have your credits issued, go to the market and, and purchase. So you can take a screenshot. This is basically what you're doing as carbon, as fast carbon. It, it, it's, we, of course, we are in line with whatever is happening in the real life scenario. And of course, what the platform does is we, we plug in, we plug in uh, what is it potential buyers, potential investors. And of course, because most people might not be aware of where they go to Vera, how do you go to Vera? How do you do the science? So as a company, we, we do all these plugins. And then of course, we, we walk the journey with you until the, the very end. So if it's 20 years, yes, you and I will see each other to, for those, um, 20 years, and, and uh, if you want to learn more about us or you, you want to do an inquiry to the company to see where your company, and to share our company page, the, let me just type it. Um, just type it. Let me type our company. Uh, and also, if you want my contact details, I put my name. My name there, put my email address and phone number. You can WhatsApp me. So it is, or, 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 if, or, or if you are invited by Nana, you can always reach out through her and she will link you up. So you can go to www.fast app. That is our company website. That's our company website. And um, we shall be showing the dashboard of the projects you have when you're launching the, the platform in the Africa Climate Summit. We are going to be doing something there. But if you want early access, you just click the button saying early access. And then you put in your details. You say, yeah, are you a project owner or the originator? Or basically, who are you? Click submit. And then within 24 to 48 hours, somebody will reach out to you. And uh, we start working this nice, beautiful marriage that will end in 20 or 30 years, but we will work with you until then. Yes. OK. Um, so this company called UC Berkeley is a university. They've been able to um, map out all the projects in the voluntary market globally. I, I know I'm, I'm now becoming a little bit too much. Just bear with me. We are almost there. Let me share with you um, something that will show you all the voluntary carbon projects in the world. And, and I think we're almost done. We're almost done, we're almost done. My, my screen is loading. Loading. Chant, um, before, before you finish this, you also said you will show the methodology. Um, oh, yes. After also, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, I will, I will show an example of a methodology. Okay, so um, I hope you can now see my screen. So let me go to map. Uh -huh. So, if I come and click, I hope you can see this map. Yes, you can see. Then if I click Kenya, it's showing me, let me just maximize my screen. If I, if I, if I go over Kenya, it's showing in the Republic of Kenya, there are 224 voluntary carbon projects registered across all the registries as of now. That's what I said. Eh? If you are here, your friends started, but they're not far. We can start it and see how can you make this to 25, 300, 1,000. We want to have many, many projects in Kenya and Africa in general. So this particular dashboard helps me in doing some analytics, but let me go not go into the details, but, but yes, it is a useful tool. Okay. 
I'm supposed to share this in my deck. We're almost at the end. I, I know we have. Uh, it's not project, it's not moving. Sorry, guys, just a minute. I'm so something. Sorry, it's just trying to share this. Okay. Okay. Now I can move. So I'm just moving to where I was. Okay, I, I, I think I've spoken about carbon finance, how you can use carbon credits to reduce the cost of production and operational costs. Yeah, so you, you just take a screenshot of this. If you're into renewable energy programs, I, I think there's somebody was asked something about how long that a renewable energy program do, will take. As you know, if you're doing a wind turbine <laughs> or a solar project, it's capital intensive. So for you, I'll ask you to do an ERPA, but you can talk more about this, eh? but you need to do an ERPA so as you can have out of take because you may generate electricity from your solar farm or your wind farm, but you must have an off-taker, somebody to consume your energy. So if you're looking for a community or the government, then you must send an ERPA. For those in Kenya, you, I think you know, you, you have been wondering if you have got so many renewable energy, why are, we, why are we paying so much? One of the reasons is because we engage the IPPs who are using uh, dirty energy, and government signed these contracts like 20 years ago. So with an ERPA, you cannot breach an ERPA. If you breach an ERPA argument, you still have to pay for the balance. Like when you're terminated, that cost. Eh? Somebody, somebody just terminated like that. Eh? You have to be paid for the remainder of your contract. Those of, those of you who are footballers, when, 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 when Aswan Wenga was fired, he was paid for the remainder of his uh, contract, we so to say. So yeah, but... If you're into renewable energy, ERPA, the others, you can do for purchase agreements, and of course, you can get assistance. Then lastly, innovations. I talked about blockchain. I know most of you say, yeah, blockchain, you think of Bitcoin, and then you say, ah, scam, no. There's something we are doing. I, I don't want to, to get into the details because we're, we're trying to do something on blockchain and artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning. As you have seen, when you're doing a PD, it's very complicated. Some of these things are time consuming. So you can leverage some of these things. If you're doing a contract, and this product must go there for 20, 30 years, within the blockchain ecosystem or framework, there's something we call smart contracts. Yes, a smart contract will be able to be captured digitally, stored within the blockchain, and remain there in perpetuity until the, the completion of the contract. So you have got no worries of security issues of somebody passing away or whatnot. And then also in the blockchain, there's something we, we call tokenization. I don't talk too much about it. Let me just um, post it there. And maybe we can have a session different on how we can use technology. And I'm speaking, I want to reach out to those people who are good in, in, uh, in uh, technology, coders and whatnot. In fact, uh, quite a number of employees here are, uh, are uh, people with a background in software development, software engineering. Because some of the tools that we are a climate tech company, but also environmental based, but some of the solutions are providing is tech based. And then there's something called IoT. Remember, you see the way your prepaid meter in Kenya is a smart meter. You, you buy tokens and then you load and then the power just comes back automatically. That's what you call IoT. So there's something also we're doing. And then another innovation is called the carbon capture. I've mentioned the example of uh, geology. And then there's something also important called digital MRV. If you have a million acres of forest, there's no way we can physically do MRV for the entire one million acres. Let's be realistic. So we have to leverage on digital technology to do the monitor report and verification. One example is using what we call NDVI, satellite data, that is normalized differentiated vegetation index. We take a satellite image of your forest in the year 2023, and then again in 2024. Six. Theoretically, if you are doing the right thing, then the image should show more green and less brown. That's just an example. Okay, so these are just imagined things which are there. 
you can read on your own. And uh, briefly, the end, but let me just uh, let me just show. Let me just open an example of a PDD. So an example of a methodology. Yeah, sorry, an example of a methodology. Okay, which one do I show you? Let me show you in uh, Cookstores. Yes. Just give me a minute. I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm going into my my my. Okay. And please don't be scared with with the science again. It's not as complicated. Eh? It's not that complicated. So one of the standards is called gold standard. So this methodology, it's something we are doing with a, a client. So this one is called, this is a methodology for metered and, me and measured energy cooking devices. If you want to do an e-cooking, it's a carbon project, you can use gold standard. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm just saying, I'm giving as an example, please don't misquote me. So there's something I mentioned about additionality. Let me just click there. Sorry, uh, project additionality, availability, scope. Okay, so for example, this particular methodology, if you're looking at doing something in e cooking, it will, it, it will then tell you the classification of devices applicable. And then it will tell you. Why it's applicable and how you can make sure you get a couple of credit. So there's the electric cook stop, which is very straightforward. I think in, in current market, there's a lot of EPCs. You've been hearing a lot of EPC, EPC, especially the one that's boiling, that boils rice. Eh? That's where they are before they are. LPG cook, cook stop, I'll tell you why LPG is here. Bagas, it's everywhere. And then I, can, I think you know the one in Kenya. Now, the basic principle, if your cook stop is still going to be relying on fossil fuel, then you must demonstrate that it's going to be 40% efficient. So in the case of the LPG or the RAC, it is there. Project, uh, yeah, it says project has a technology design that has predictable out performance, proven to be efficient, durable. For fuel-based cook stove, it must be 40% efficient. So things like easy Jikokoa, they are 40% efficient. It's still running on charcoal, but it's unlike the normal Jiko, which is just a metallic structure, there's some other things, there's the clay and there's whatever design that put there that makes it more efficient. Okay, so a methodology will give you a number of parameters that your project has to satisfy. And, and for every type of project, the 170, believe you me, there is a methodology for that. And where there is no methodology, the registry bodies allows somebody to develop a methodology and get a joint certification from a scientific body. Or for example, if you want to design a new methodology dealing with mangroves, so you have to make sure people from the forestry are going to satisfy and say, yeah, this methodology makes sense and gives you the stamp of approval. Think of it like in, in academia, we call it the peer review journal. You do your thesis, and then your peers in this journal of economics or journal of methodology, they come and review it and gives you a stamp of approval. So if there's no methodology, or if you want to have your methodology, you can do so, but it must be approved by a body of that particular industry, okay? And if you're coming with a technology, the technology also has to be approved by somebody. So for example, in Kenya, if you are doing and you want quality assurance for technology in, in, the, in the space of e-cooking, Kirby, the Kenya Industrial Research Development Institute, eh? yeah, the, the, the ones who do the testing. If you are here and an electrical engineer, you know about something called water boiling tests and whatever. So Kirby will be certifying your tests and so forth and so forth. Lastly, I know most of you are into forestry. So I think I'll only be do you justice if I show you a methodology in forestry. Let me see what I have here. Just give me about half a minute. Or, or you know what? Let, let me just tell you where you get them. Eh? Teach them how to fish, as they say. So let me go to the Vera website. 
So allow me to share my screen. I, I, I just show you where if you if you have got an interest in 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 reading these things on your own. So I've gone to the Vera registry or Vera website, and now you want the methodologies. So there's a place where you go to the methods. Wait. Okay. It's not happening. I think this is a, are we sharing? Yeah, so when you go to the homepage, you, you click on resources, you click methodologies, then you come to methodologies. Okay, you remember I talked about plastic credits, the methodology of plastic credits is there. If you're looking at uh, satisfying your good and benefits and whatever, you go to SD Vista. But if you just want a typical methodology, let's go to VCS methodology. And then, so you want to do something in forestry. Okay, if I want to do something in forestry, let me, do, let me not do IFM, it's stupid. Let me do Red Plus. So I just come and look for it plus they're, they're, they're numbered. Or if you want to do on, on soil organic carbon, you come to VM42. If you want to do on livestock methane, you come and take a VM41 for livestock methane. So I want to do something on forestry. Okay, so I Okay, good. I'll use VM7, VM007. I click the link there. It will open. It will give me a brief description. Da, 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 da. Then you click download. It's going to download. Let me open the downloaded document. And I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. So I want to do. I want to do a, a forest program, Red Plus, and uh, within the Vera ecosystem. I'm now displaying VM007. And then here, you, 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 you come down, it should be telling you, it will explain to you the applicability, the sources, the carbon pool, how do you even get the best narrow? Let's go to section seven on additionality, page 29. So as you can see, what are the specific additionality instrumentation when you're doing a forest program in Vera? Yeah, so here, in fact, eh, we even have tools eh, which go towards helping you to assess and, and verify that you can do the additionality. And to tell you, go to CDM tool number, AR tool 14 or whatever it is, download it and do the calculation for additionality. It's very, very specific. So literally, you don't have to do any thinking in terms of OI oh, data no. The first thing you need to do is when you have your idea and your consultant or your developer, then they'll get the methodology and then the methodology will guide you. Think of it like the commandments. The methodology will guide you step by step until the point now you have a PDD. So as when you're bringing this validator, whom you're paying good money, he don't come and say, no, you need to make this change. Because when, you, when they come and validate and they find there's something wrong, they'll tell you how to do ABCD. Then they go back. Then you, you want them to come back again, you have to pay more money. In, in, in here, we say Zamganga has Rudi. Yes? What you give, <laughs> which doctor has not come back, literally. So you make sure by the time you're bringing in this um, validator and verifier, you have done everything that this methodology has told you you need to do. And the uh, last point before I, I open for questions, et cetera, et cetera, is there, there are some 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 circumstances whereby you might want to use a CDA methodology when you're doing a voluntary carbon project. For example, the the ethanol GICO in Kenya is using a CDA methodology. It is allowed because, for example, you might find it more efficient for you, or you might find it better understanding. However, if you choose to do the CDA methodology in in the case of Kenya, for example, you have to get the letter of authority from the designated national authority in Kenya. In the case of Kenya, as of now, it is NEMA, the National Environmental Management Authority, NEMA. So NEMA will give you a letter of authority 
to use a CD methodology to develop your carbon project. And then when you have done your PDD using CDM, you inform a VCM registry like Vera or Gold Standard that you want to anchor your projects based on CDM on them. Most likely they'll say yes, because all this VCM registry and the methodologies, their mother and their father is CDM. And, and, and as I wind down, and I allow you guys to ask your questions, let me open the CDM registry and I show you the bioethanol project that was registered, who, how they registered it and where they went to. But otherwise, I think for now, for now, I, 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 can, I can stop there to allow questions, comments. Let me just share the last thing. Promise this is the last thing sharing visually. So I'm op I've opened the UNFCC CDM portal where the Bartner Jiko Coco Kenya is registered. I, I don't I, I don't say what POA means, but in a nutshell, remember when I was talking about grouping projects? So POA is where it's the it means program of activities, it's in Kenya, and then you can have, if let's say I want to do a project in, in the term Sub-Saharan Africa, in Kenya, Uganda, and Malawi, I'll do the POA, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then CPA, component of project activity one will be Kenya, CPA two, Uganda, CPA three, Malawi. That will make me reduce the cost of project implementation. That's why I said, even if you have one acre or two cows, we can still use it because I know I'm going to group it and anchor it in my platform. So as you can see here, this is a, uh, this is a, Coco Kenya, this is where they came, the documents are here. It's publicly accessible information. Even the calculation, you can see I'm pointing to average distance calculation. It's an Excel document you can download. This, this document I'm trying to open here, if it will show, it will show the, the letter of authority from the designated national authority. By the way, does anybody have a question? Do you want to ask it? Yes, I opened this document. The, the letter that now Coco went to DNA in Kenya, who is Nema, who told them, I as DNA, I authorize you based on the powers and blah, blah, blah. Let me just open it here. The reason why I'm, I'm showing all these documents is for you guys to know, number one, there is no lying, there is no conspiracy, there is no cartel. All the documents will be put online for everybody to see. And this is the letter from Nema. Letter of approval for Kenya. You can go ahead, use the, you can see I'm pointing green development mechanism, POA, whatever. It's for Article 12 of the Kyoto Protocol. The government of Kenya is a part of the Kyoto Protocol, blah, 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 all that. But you asked for this document in NEMA, you might not even get it. But the voluntary carbon market, the carbon market is a very, very transparent and open market. There's no line. There's, there's nothing you do without others knowing and knowing you how you did it because you encourage transparency and want to encourage knowledge sharing. With that said, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to create a drive folder, give you the link here. And then by end of day, I'll have put some of these resources there for you guys to, 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 um, um, to, to, uh, to allow you to, to interact the documents. Um, yeah, so that the microphone is open. I'm putting my contact details for those who want to have a further conversation. And then we can call it a beautiful. Charles, there's a question on the, on the chat. Okay, let me see chat box. How can you reduce emissions in fecal sludge management? So like the, the specifics, Amma, what, what, what do you want? Project specifics, I'll prefer to do it offline. I just want the general questions. But if you're looking to do something within uh, waste management, then the question I'll ask you is this. Huh? Whatever you're collecting and recycling, how 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 is it in, what, what 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 do you want to do with the end product? For example, if you are doing a landfill project, the idea is as you're doing the waste 
recycling and management, the idea is that the generation of gas should go towards the production of energy, renewable energy. Because that then will, will speak to who? Will speak towards the avoidance mechanism. So whatever you're doing, you must tie down to, to the abatement. What you're trying to abet and so forth and so forth. So Juliet, if you want um, more technical, you can do an email. You can have a talk. Is there another question in the chat box? Okay, I can see Kennedy hand is up. Kennedy, Kennedy, your hand is up. Yeah, can I ask a question as it prepares? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I have a number of questions. Eh? Uh -huh. uh, and well, just from a layman's uh, uh, approach, because this is uh, like something new that has just come and seen it for the first time. M my just funny question will be, why are you uh, teaching us this? Oh, and, the why? Uh, w w w yes, the why. And what is the, the motivation behind uh, your organization? Uh, uh, teaching us this mm -hmm. and I'm looking at it like uh, we are this is a very diversified group because we are like uh, covering the whole of Africa yes so that is one teacher, question maybe I could ask several then you can ask let, all let, of me, them. let me go let me go one by one eh? I think yes. it might be easier yes. okay it's a company yes. okay I'll, I'll be I'll be in fact uh, Thank you, Charles. I hope you will be able to share. You'll be able to share your uh, website. Eh? I think you have not shared that. Then, as you prepare that, then the next thing you you've somehow partially helped. How do we really now walk this talk? How do we now get into real business? And of course, uh, some of the challenges that we may face, we may not have the money. We may be interested, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, we may know how to connect a few people here and there in the villages and uh, use the village cluster system. But how do we really now get exposed? How, how do we get the exposure? Because sometimes, you know, even uh, moving and uh, going to the county, sometimes you are not recognized. You may spend two or three days even before you see the director or the person concerned. How do we walk this talk? How do we get into the system and move on? Uh, uh, thank you for that. So if you, if let's say you, you have an idea in terms of a carbon project that you might want to engage with as a company, I've, I've shared with you our email there, the website, sorry, the website, the place where you can click early access, where you're able to now send your inquiry, or you can even have my email address and send it to me. I know your worry is finance, I can, I, and I'm telling you from an, as an insider, money is your list of concerns. Believe you me, specialty issue. The issue is getting a high quality project that can get community buy-in, stakeholder buy-in, and investor buy-in. Money is not the problem. The problem is the actual project. So if you think money is the procedure, my friend, People are, there are people out here who want to invest, but where, how, with who, when, okay? So money should be a problem, the project. So if, if, if you have something in mind and you want some ideas, we, we do some, some of the consulting we do for free in terms of uh, uh, just general information like what you're doing here, or let's say if an idea, I, I can just uh, tell you, look at this angle, look at that angle. If it's a community project, speak to this person, speak to that person, that guidance here, we just give it to you. You are, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's, I mean, there's nothing. We, we are looking at a bigger play, the carbon project, which is 20, 30 years. See, yapa hii, nakatana kongea. Are we together? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so finance should be an, an issue. And as I said, everything we do or you should do is contracts. Contracts, yes. agreement. Actually, MOU. MO, we, we know MOUs in Kenya have not worked politically. Ours is a legal contract. That those are the things we have an NDA and non disclosure agreement. We agree between this period of time when we're talking about ABCD, we cannot disclose information, you cannot disclose, and I cannot disclose both parties. And then we have the exploration agreement whereby we are scoping out. We, do, we even do some feasibility on our own cost to see if this thing is bankable. Then, okay, it's bankable. This is how we need to move forward. 
So don't let money be a hindrance. Uh, as, as they say, eh, kuona na kushika ni bure. <laughs> so literally, money should, be, <laughs> money should not be a problem. It should not. It's the quality of the... Thank for you. me, it's quality. Quality. Very good. Next person. Th- thank you, Charles. I'm here. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Kennedy. yes. Kennedy? Yes. Can I speak? Kennedy speak. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yes, my mine is is a, is a is a motivation to start and I think that is what uh, probably everybody here is looking at. Uh I don't know whether it was covered uh, before I joined, but and uh, one thing is that I know many of many of the guys here might be talking about forest, the forest one uh, planting forest or whatever trees. Yes. Now in one word, or in as many words as you can, an acre of uh, probably under a forest, uh, how would you motivate somebody? What would be the expectation thereof after assuming that everything is gone? I think let's start it from there to motivate okay. people to go, go forward with it. If, if you have one acre of forest, and, and, and of course the forest is yours, you have the land rights because the owner of the land rights is the owner of the carbon credits. Technically, there are some exceptions, but yeah, just generally that's the principle. And and we are able to know how the the, the history of the forest in terms of was it was it uh, are you trying to avoid the conversion? Was it deforested? So we, we can settle the additionality because forests are very very tricky. So if that has been covered, I will say number one, in as much as. Uh, Developing a one acre forest on its own will be costly. I will then say, you allow us as a company to aggregate or group you with others for the purposes of economies of scale. I, I, I hope I'm clear on that. So for example, if you are based, let's say your forest is in, uh, um, um, let's say your one acre is somewhere located in Narrow County, and there are several others within Narrow County or the surrounding counties of Narrow, we can group you together. That way, it will reduce the cost of project development because the biggest issue is the project development. Bringing, let me just tell you, bringing a, a, a third party auditor, we are looking at $20,000, dollars I mean, you, you get my point. So we prefer to group so as you handle the economies of scale. So as a motivation or where do you start? It starts with you having a concept and then now simply reaching out. Then when you reach out to the concept, I can give you a very more technical information, like a one pager. Based on information, this is what I'm seeing and this is how we can proceed and these are the timelines. And I've said it here. It's not a two month thing, it's not a three month thing. Eh? This is a long term marriage. We are working together. Yeah, next person. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, yes, go ahead. Can you can you can you talk about dollars here? Assume the ones that have gone through. <laughs> okay. The, 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 the benefit out of an acre is how much? I think that is what 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 many people would want to see, such that when I enter into this, I know that that would be my target. Whatever, based on what has happened, whatever that uh, averagely, I'm not saying things will be the same. Okay, so. If, if you, are, you, are, you are the owner of the, the land, let me ask you, if you look at an acre per square meter, how many trees do you think you can plant in a square meter? For example. Probably 800 to 1,000. A square meter, square meter, meter. Oh, a square meter. Yes. Uh, no, I think um, a square meter is just about one tree. Go home one with tree. Yes. So how many, how many trees do you think you can plant in one acre? If you go by that that analogy, mm-hmm. I think the current rate that uh, that is there is between eight hundred yeah, so probably one thousand five hundred. Yes. Now, with, with that in mind, and assuming the entire acre is, is uh, you're assuming the entire acre, you're just doing trees and nothing else. Uh, you? Is able to accommodate one thousand six hundred um, siblings. Angalia, I, I, I'm talking about trees. <laughs> you know, okay, let, let, me, let me give you a bit of science. Huh? 
if you're looking at so, a seedling, a seedling is barely one meter tall, yeah? You cannot compare the carbon sequestration potential of a seedling and a tree, like a tree which is like five or seven years of age. I think you understand why? Because the carbon is stored in the biomass of the tree, the trunks, the leaves, the branches, and below ground. So a tree which is five years old will obviously capture more than a mere seedling. I, I think we, we understand. So we don't even talk about carbon projects from, of nurseries. Forget about nurseries. We're talking about now these trees that are growing. And if you want something that's going to go very fast, look at bamboo. Bamboo, bamboo is good, but the bamboo is really on a commercial forestry, which has its own um, complications. Are we together? I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm making some bit of sense, but typically one carbon credit from a forest program ideally will get you anywhere between six and ten dollars. But if there's an aspect of co benefits, it might go higher. But typical pricing is six to ten dollars per carbon credit. The person was asking, I don't know if I've answered you or you wanted to be more specific. <clears throat> so no, I think I'll no. leave it at that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my own my calculations. Thanks. Okay. I have a question. Eh? Yes, go ahead. Charles. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, my question is this one. Eh? I wanted to know, like, uh, if I have planted 50 acres of trees um, and I want to claim the, the carbon credits, I wanted to know which organizations pay the carbon credit. Which organizations? I hope you have gotten my question. Yeah, as in you have an acre of 15,000 15, acre forest and you want to get carbon credits. Yes. Hey, can, can the, is the person there? The one who was asking the question. He's asking uh, who will pay for the credit yeah. for the carbon credit for fifty thousand uh, acres. Okay. First of all, I, I hope you are here from the beginning when I, I I mentioned the credits are issued by a registry. Then when you are given the the credits, it's for you to get a buyer. And most of these buyers are outside the continent. I, I don't know if I've answered your question because getting a credit is not money. The registry does not give you money. The registry gives you credit. The certificate that says your project between this year has captured this amount of carbon credits. Then it's for you or your project development company to get these buyers, but not the registry. The registry only gives you, it's thing of it like the, the, the like NEC. NEC gives you yeah, like it's a certificate. What and how you do with it is it's your business. I, I hope I'm making sense. The one who asked the question. Okay, next person. Uh, hello, Charles. Hello, hello Charles. Yes, Musa. Yeah, so first, uh, I'd like to uh, appreciate you for this great, uh, uh, great conversation and the training that you've, uh, you've done. Uh, and I'm incredibly excited to be part of this uh, webinar. So uh, as, as, uh, as one of the members of Ocean News Innovators, we are actually a number uh, in this webinar today. So we really uh, into carbon markets because we, 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 we're starting actually, we're still uh, crawling uh, uh, because our legs are yet to support our weight. So we're hoping to maybe partner with your organization in future if that is possible, so that we can at least uh, have someone who was already who already has knowledge and expertise in this field, and we're really looking to working with you at least to also grow together. So thank you so much, else. Thank you for that, and and please feel free to to reach out because one thing that the industry is big on is uh, the partnerships, partnerships, partnership, partnership. If there's something we may be able to do and something we might be able to do, but a particular partner might be able to do. So partnerships are always welcome. So the way usually we, we, we go about it is um, 
we have uh, what you call an introductory call, where we, we sit down with a potential partner or a collaborator, then we look at the areas of synergy, and then from there, we take it off. So yes, we, we are very, very open to, to these kinds of engagements. Yes, Abdi Richard Dollar. Oh, next person, please. Um, Charles, I think there's also a question on the chat box. Um, uh, I'm really interested in joining your company. So, okay, if you're interested in joining the company as maybe a member of staff, you can drop me an email, then you let me know your interest. Are you looking for internship? Are you looking for <coughs> Then I can take it from there. Yeah. Hi Charles, how are you? This is Rafik Mohammed from Monakuru. Yes. 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 Can I please just have one person who speaking? Rafik. Yeah. Others, please. Mojen. Yes, Rafik. Rafik. Rafik Mohammed from Nakuru. I think. Uh, that was a very good and educative, pro, proper, proper, well planned uh, explanation. I would like to actually encourage you to do more of this and maybe. An invitation will be in order for you to come to Nakuru and we do one of these fine days, something here. If that will be possible, I'll send you an email. I'll, 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 be, I'll be glad to, to, to come down there. At the, at the, at the university level, community level, I'm happy. And I think there's a question to comment from Anne. Kenya is developing a framework on carbon trading. Currently, how will existing projects align or we don't expect uh, to follow the existing law framework? Okay. One thing with law is a, a law cannot. A law, please switch off your mic. Okay. Uh, so, with, and with regards to your question, Anne, in law, we say a law cannot be applied at all respectively. So, usually, what happens with the carbon projects or even the different legal standards in a given country, a project is allowed to align its projects to the existing framework, but it cannot be stopped or or, or impact, impacted without prejudice, because uh, when, when you're doing a project like, a, a project like, let's say, Mikokomoja, it has already been developed and there are pre existing contracts with different players and whatnot. So, any new law in the country cannot be punitive to an already existing methodology. That is usually the case with law. Yeah. So, new projects would then be directly be impacted. However, if you are referring to the case of the climate change bill, the other sections on uh, issues of revenue, repatriation, whatever, what I know is there's always a provision given within the schedule of any act of parliament towards responding to projects or entities which are already in existence. And I, I just want to use the example of, uh, of contracts. If, I mean, you see like the case of the IPP contracts, uh, they were signed and government agreed to be paying them uh, to be buying the, the, the power, the energy from this independent power producer at let's say X Kenyan shillings. It's, it can be hand, let's say 100 Kenyan shillings. The government today cannot wake up and say, we're going to pay you 20 shillings because of whatever. That's just leads to legal problems and complications. And also the last thing the government wants is to scare away investors and developers because the most of the money that will come to us for development comes from investors, whether it's going to be local or foreign, Ajalishi. So the government has to do a balancing act. But ultimately, a law cannot be prejudicial to an exi already existing framework. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Kibet, you have a question? Okay. I, I, I just think, want to... I think, Charles, we can close maybe because. For any other person who has a question, they can just uh, yeah. leave the details and yeah. the email. I can compile them, send it to you, and then probably that's when you can answer them. Okay, I, I, I think that's... Drive. Yeah, uh, let me just uh, finish on the Google Drive and then by today, tomorrow, we should be able to have more content in the Drive folder.